Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. Ever since I was a young boy, I always dreamed of being a park ranger, patrolling campgrounds and chatting with some of the friendly campers, hiking trails to make sure everything was easily maneuverable and just spending time in nature. Being in nature has always been my way of disconnecting from reality. Whenever things got stressful in life, I would hit the trails or go backpacking for a few days or rent a campsite in some remote area in the woods. My parents were never supportive of my goals. They would much rather seen the letters M.D. after my name or my face on a billboard advertising towards people who were involved in traffic collisions. Oh, well, I put in an application for one of the county parks near my house, not really expecting much out of it. I was fresh out of high school, no college experience yet flipping hamburgers and dealing with people who find a reason to complain and everything, so there was no harm at all in putting out applications. I pulled up a Google map directory of every local, state, county, and national park in my state, California, and submitted applications wherever I saw openings. I even called a few parks that I really liked to see if they had any positions available, but hadn't any luck for months. My bank account was starting to dwindle as a result of constant maintenance on my 3 Civic, which had been put through more than the manufacturers could ever design the cars to experience, and I was starting to stress. I would pinch my pennies together at gas stations, skip meals altogether when I didn't have anything readily available at home, and try to cruise 55 on the freeways to be more efficient with what little fuel I had. I definitely didn't expect this to be my reality after high school, but I guess I should. Uh, my parents kicked me out the minute they found out I was gay, and I was left living in my car for months until I found someone who would let me crash on their couch. It was really mentally challenging just trying to convince myself to keep going through everything, but I had this gut feeling that things would work out eventually. I know it sounds kind of weird, but this life wasn't half bad. I mean, I saved a fair bit of money on rent because Dylan let me sleep on his couch at night for free. I took my Civic with me wherever I drove. To the beaches, the forests, and mountains east, the deserts. Sleeping in the car wasn't too bad. I wasn't exactly the most picky camper in the world and knew that it was cheaper than renting a hotel every night. Eventually, I'd have loved to get a van or in Suv to have more room, but for now the rusty bucket of problems we call a Civic would have to work. I remember the day that I got the email. I had just checked my bank account balance to see that I had $7.80 left. I was a few thousand miles over when I should gotten my oil changed, and my front brakes were squeaking again, most likely as a result of the axle leaking grease and corroding them. Like I said, rusty bucket of problems. An email was in my inbox that read, National Park Service. Immediately hiring full-time ranger must be willing to relocate. Base salary, 65000 Respond for info. I'd never been a religious lad, but this felt like a godsend. I'd never seen more than $5,000 in my bank account at one time, let alone 65000 a year. As a base salary... Of course, I had to reply to them and send a message that read, Hi there, I'm Jake, a wilderness enthusiast based in California. I'd love to learn more about your opening with the National Park Service. I am willing to relocate wherever, although it might take time for me to get there. Let me know if you'd like to interview me. I attached a copy of my resume, which had a fair bit of information that would have proved I was the right candidate for the job ample experience in the wilderness, knowledge on most survival skills, excellent physical shape, good worth ethic. I had beefed up my resume as much as possible. I don't know if I would have been able to forgive myself if they said I was unqualified or didn't get the position. That wouldn't have been an issue, though. About 24 hours later, I got a response from a woman by the name of Abigail inviting me to do a tele-interview a day later. 
I started to feel giddy with excitement at the prospect of finally landing my dream job with the National Park Service. Not only that, but having accommodation, stable income, and being able to spend time surrounded by the beauty of nature is all I could ask for in life. I set a reminder on my laptop that I had an interview and hastily jotted down the number that she said she would be calling me from. I tried so hard to focus at work that day, but it felt like I was stumbling over orders and making careless mistakes again and again. Every time I slipped up, the manager walked over and yelled at me, then muttered to herself in Spanish and walked away. I was so close to quitting on the spot, but something told me to hold off just a bit longer until I know for sure if I got the new job yet. Fast forward to the next day, Abigail called me about five minutes late. She asked me pretty basic questions. My past work experience, my work ethic, asked me to describe some of the experience I have had in the wilderness and what knowledge I can bring to the team. I answered her questions honestly and very thoughtfully, making sure to reference real-world scenarios whenever possible so she didn't think I was bluffing with all the experience I claimed to have. It seemed to be going great, and I was certain I would the position. I was smiling wider than I had smiled in months when she asked me the question that sticks with me to this day. Are you afraid of what lurks in the shadows of the trees at night, Jake? It took me a minute to figure out how to respond to this. I didn't expect her to ask me that. When I was going over interview questions the night before, I planned just about everything out, even some follow-up questions to ask her about the position that would show how interested I am. I had not prepared for this. I'd never been afraid of the woods or any nature at all. I had no reason to be. I knew everything there was to know about defending myself. I could use a knife pretty well, was a great aim with a crossbow, and had even made my own bows before out of materials in the woods. I didn't exactly believe in supernatural beings or demonic entities, so there was no reason to be afraid. Still, her question unsettled me a little bit. I tried to convince myself that it was just a joke and she wasn't serious. But the lack of laughter matching my nervous laughter shot that theory down pretty quickly. I took a deep breath and responded, I've never been afraid of the shadows in the trees. I do just fine in the wilderness and have never been in a situation where I feel like I lost control. Her response sent chills up my spine. I reckon you should be, honey. She's always watching, even if it feels like she left. No matter how far you go, she'll always be a few steps behind you. She's always smiling, too, if you dare ignore. Abigail cut off as she began talking to someone else on her end of the line, assumingly a co-worker or another park ranger. She eventually put herself on mute, and I spent a few moments processing what had happened. Who is, uh, what happens if you ignore her? I felt a bit uneasy, but then realized that Abigail works with the parks. I feel like to work with an Ann P is, you have to be at least a bit crazy. Not many people would want to give up the luxuries of fast internet, guaranteed electricity, and a healthy social life to live alone in the middle of the woods, patrolling and yelling at people who started fires outside of fire pits. Even if you weren't crazy getting in, chances are by the time you retire, you'll have a therapist on speed dial. I tried to chalk it up to being that an older lady who was starting to lose her mind and brushed it off as no big deal. Just as I came to my conclusion, I heard Abigail's voice on the other end of the line again. Congratulations, Jake. You're perfect for the position. We're going to send you a ticket for your plane that'll be embarking to Alaska to start in Denali National Park in three days. Do you have any more questions? I froze for a minute. I was going to Alaska in three days. This moment was honestly the happiest of my life thus far. The realization that everything I had dreamed of was starting to fall into place. I was likely going to be surrounded by millions of trees, millions of acres of land, and one of the most beautiful landscapes the world has to offer. It had been my dream to visit Alaska one day, and now I got to live there and get paid to do so. But I had to find out more. I wanted to know what she meant earlier about the girl who watches you, 
Even though I'm almost positive it was nothing, I wanted to hear it from her, just to ease my racing mind. I decided to start with a pretty general question. What should I bring with me? I asked. She responded quickly, Just your clothing, and anything you might want in your station. Phone, laptop, and charger, winter clothing, a few decorations or memories from home, any other weird gadgets you love, and maybe a pocket knife. We'll provide everything else you need. I didn't exactly have a lot to my name, aside from my car and a few boxes of crap that I'd collected over the years, so I figured I'd pack light. I had to do a bit of shopping for winter clothing, as it's never cold enough to warrant heavy jackets in Southern California, but that would be a lot easier when I had the couple hundred dollars my car was worth in pocket. I felt like we were comfortable enough with each other, so I asked the question. You said something earlier about a woman who watches you? I asked hesitantly, half expecting her to hang up on me and deny me the job right then and there. But she chuckled and responded, Oh, sorry about that. Sometimes my brain acts all wonky with these interviews. She cleared her throat and continued. It was just one of those moments. Nothing to be afraid about. That explanation resonated with me, and I thanked her for her time and hung up. I could hardly sleep at night, anticipation for my flight and vivid dreams about the forests, the wildlife, and life as a ranger filed my thoughts constantly. One night it got so hard I had to take Benadryl just to make myself drowsy enough to get a few hours of shut-eye. It was the day of the flight. Dallin helped me with my bags and drove me to the airport. I decided I would give him the rest of the money I had, as I was sure there wouldn't be any convenience stores where I was heading, and left him everything I couldn't take with me. I don't know if he was just taking it, so I didn't have to lug it down to Goodwill or deal with a horror commonly known as Facebook Marketplace, but I appreciated it either way. I entered the terminal, scanned my boarding pass, and checked my duffel bags and carried a pack with me that had all my technology. Crappy point and shoot camera I'd saved for years. My laptop cell phone with contacts of the few people I wanted to remain close with. And a few notebooks because I loved writing. Of course, I had all my hiking gear packed. Even though they said they'd provide me with gear of my own when I got there, it was too difficult to part with the shoes and poles and things that had kept me going for so many years when I had nothing else to look forward to. I boarded my plane, threw my backpack in the overhead stowaway bin, and prepared for takeoff. This was it, the moment that my entire life's hoping and working had culminated into. Every struggle I had, every moment of doubt, whether I wanted to keep pushing on through the poverty and pain was gone. My dreams were about to become a reality. I braced myself for takeoff and shut my eyes to get a little bit of rest while the plane began its six-hour journey towards Alaska. The plane touched down at Anchorage International, and it would be a short drive to get to the park where I would be stationed. I was greeted by a friendly face who I assumed to be Abigail. She was a frail woman, most likely in her late fifties, but had this fire in her eyes. She didn't look tough, but I had to assume she was a lot stronger than her appearance put on. Behind her was a man, about my height and a little more muscular. I assumed he would be training me or working with me at my post. Neither of them said much other than exchanging basic pleasantries, and I was instructed to follow her to the van that they had arranged for transportation. The minute I stepped foot out of the airport, I was in shock. Alaska was absolutely beautiful. I'd seen pictures of it before, watched a few shows on television when I used to have cable, and of course seen plenty of YouTube videos that people put out there, but it's just so much more incredible in person. The trees in the distance, the chilly air that just felt so much fresher than the city air, the dynamic of people in the area all felt so surreal. It truly felt like home, home, something I really needed at that point in my life. We got in the van, a small white transit that definitely showed some signs of use and headed north towards Denali National Park. I sat next to the muscular man whose name I learned to be Zeke. Abigail had left a bit earlier. 
I guess it was just me and Zeke right now, and the person driving the van who had a weird love for classical music. I put one of my earbuds in, knowing that I probably wouldn't get a lot of time to listen to music during orientation, and enjoyed the drive as the sun started to sleepily duck down under the huge snow-capped mountains to my right. Eventually, we got to the ranger station. It was a small building, but from the outside, it looked very inviting. The walls were made of wood, and the lights had a yellowish glow to them. There were windows on all sides, and a little check-in desk for those who were driving through. Surrounding the ranger station were towering green trees, which I recognized to be primarily white spruce. And to the left, a bit there was a building that looked like some form of bathroom connected to a garage. I'd gotten to know Zeke a bit on the ride up. He was pretty quiet, but we had a lot of similarities. He was only a few years older than I was, and had also been kicked out of his house by his family, although he wouldn't tell me why. Zeke grew up in Montana, in a small town near Glacier National Park, and fell in love with the surroundings. He told me he'd been working for the national parks for a year now, and was bumped up to one of the lead positions at Denali. I really felt like I could get along with Zeke, although there was something a bit off about him. It felt like he was hiding something. It had to have been the voice. It sounded as if there was some underlying fear or anxiety in his tone. Oh well, he seemed to be a really good person, and I'd be working with him indefinitely, so there was an obligation to get along to some extent. If something happened to one of us, we had to be able to depend on the other for help. I wasn't used to this, and I knew it wouldn't come as easy as the textbooks make it feel, but it was something I could work towards. As the van pulled up to the garage next to the facilities, I motioned to get out, but Zeke reached over me and pulled the door shut once more. You're not stopping here, he said with a grin. You'll be stationed in a tower about five miles north in the forest. Everything you need should be there. A hunting rifle, clothing, gear, your phone, and the numbers that you may need to call, and a handbook with all the information that you'll need for now. He paused for a moment, then continued. I know it sounds silly, but make sure to read every page in the handbook. It's not that long, and the last guy who didn't. I could see a look of regret on Zeke's face as he realized that he had shared too much. Well, he had to replace somehow, and that's why you're here. It must have been evident that I had a look of shock on my face. I wish I had known this before I signed up for the position. But I guess it made sense. You're working in a remote area in the wilderness. All kinds of wildlife could cut your life short. If you don't know everything there is to know about the area, you could be caught with your pants down with a hungry bear looking right up at you, so to speak. I smiled and said, I'll read it all. Don't worry. The expression on his face appeared genuine, and Zeke waved as he jumped out of the van and headed towards the ranger station. I adjusted around the bed and put my feet up against the vacant left side of the van. The driver didn't say a thing and kept on driving. As the forest got denser and denser, the road felt bumpier and bumpier. Even though it didn't exactly feel like a God-sent cab ride, I felt like I was in heaven. Surrounded by trees, people who also love nature. And I was making more money doing this than I would made in three years at McDonald's. Maybe this is the closest to heaven I'll ever be. Just as I was starting to drift into sleep, I saw a huge tower in the distance. It was probably 85 feet tall and had a metal staircase that wrapped around the tower frame and led into a cabin, supposedly where I was to sleep and watch from. The driver pulled off a bit, got out of the car, and opened my door. I jumped out as well and gave my legs a moment to adjust to standing up again after hours of riding in a bumpy van. Here you are, lad. You got about a quarter mile walk to the tower through the forest to the right. He motioned his arm towards a huge expanse of trees that was surrounding the tower. It appeared as if some of the trees were taller than the tower itself. It was absolutely beautiful. I thanked him, shook his hand, put my gloves on, and began the hike towards my new home. The tower itself was amazing. It looked relatively new. The only evidence that anyone had lived in it before 
where the footprints gathered around the base of the steps. As I ascended the metal staircase that lead into the sky, I couldn't help but gawk at the beautiful expanse of forest that surrounded me. For miles and miles, all I could see were towering trees, mountains, and there was a small lake a bit to the west. Considering the only light that was guiding me at this point was that from the full moon and the stars that shone in the sky, it was amazing how well I could see. It was such a contrast from the mundane city views that I had grown to abhor and beat any hike or backpacking trip I had ever done by a long shot. A bright orange light helped me find the door. There were windows on three of the four sides of the tower, the fourth being the wall my bed was up against. When I entered the small cabin, there was a gunmetal filing cabinet and a wooden desk right next to the bed, in a locker which I presumed to hold all of my new belongings and the rifle. Around the unit were posters from various parks in Alaska, a few pictures of the staff team, and little notes about things you can see from each window. On the wooden desk was a handbook, assumingly the one I was informed about earlier. There was a black phone connected to a landline and a little memo pad that was turned upside down. I spent a few hours reading the handbook, nothing out of the ordinary. It outlined what I was supposed to be doing, some of the standard operating procedures for common events, and gave me a breakdown of the wildlife and the plants that I would likely encounter. There was a map on one of the last pages that showed my tower in relation to the other towers throughout the park and the headquarters Zeke got dropped off at. For the most part, I was just fire watch and patrolling for now. Every two days, I would hike a trail nearby my station and make sure that no fallen logs or huge grizzly corpses stopped trekkers and trucks from exploring the park. There was a page that detailed some of the things more experienced rangers got to do. Experiments with local research teams, assessing weather conditions, tagging and tracking animals through the forests, and cutting unhealthy trees into firewood to be used at the ranger station and sold in the nearest town to benefit the forest. I assumed that there would be tours as well, but no mention of those was in the handbook. I was about to turn away when I remembered that there was a little memo pad right next to me. It looked pretty worn down. The cover was entirely faded when I turned it over, except for big words on the front that read five most important things. I assumed that it was general notes on things that were happening nearby in real time. The handbook was likely a bit outdated, and the notebook allowed rangers to write down what was happening and leave reminders on current events that any new hires would need to know. But when I flipped to the first page, I felt a cold shiver run down my spine through my body. In chicken scratch handwriting, it read, 1. You work alone. I glanced around the room and didn't see anyone else with me. I figured that I would be working alone when I got to the park and Zeke got out, but it felt so dark. The writing felt like it was written as a warning of sorts in case somebody else tried to pretend they worked there. Is it possible that some of the local backpackers tried to pretend to work with the parks in order to steal, or worse? I flipped the page, and once again that shiver ran down my spine as I read the handwritten words. Two, she will not help you. I flipped the page again, anxiously glancing around the room trying to figure out who she was. Three, if you hear her crying, run. I practically ripped a page off of the memo pad as I flipped again to see what was on the following page. Four, if you see her, it's too late. I slammed the book against the counter and started pacing around the room. I knew that I was getting myself into a job that could be dangerous, but who was she? What kind of tasks was I really doing here? Aside from watching for fires and hiking trails, I really wanted to know more and soon, but I was starting to get tired and wouldn't be able to get very far with the intense jet lag and a lack of sleep recently. I took off my shirt and boots and set my backpack down next to the cot I'd be sleeping in. It was actually quite comfortable, at least more comfortable than sleeping on a couch it'd been. I decided to sleep with a utility belt on, knife, flashlight, and a Fen 5, seven pistol that I had found in the locker. Just in case, 
All of this would blow over in the morning, when I got answers, I'm sure. At least that's what I told myself as I tossed and turned in bed for twenty minutes trying to calm my nerves. I awoke to the sound of rain pattering against the roof of the tower. Great, I thought. I won't be able to hike down to the station in this weather. I got up, cleared my eyes, and blew my nose, and looked out the window. There was a heavy fog surrounding the tower, and I could barely see the trees closest to me, let alone the lake or the ranger station. I decided to look through the handbook one last time and see if I could find any phone numbers to the ranger station. When I looked through the night before, I found no mention of the phone at all, and no idea how to reach others in case of emergencies. I guess it's very possible that I was too groggy and missed a key detail. I started walking towards the wooden desk when I froze. Someone was coming up my tower. I instinctively put my hand on my hip where my 5-7 was stored and was ready to pull it out and fire. Just as I started to raise the gun, I saw a young woman's face in the window. She was wearing typical ranger attire, a heavy snow jacket, cargo pants, heavy boots. She had a utility belt on as well, with a knife and a gun similar to mine on her waist. I, laughing at my stupidity for almost killing a fellow ranger, put the gun back in its holster and opened the door. Hi, I'm Autumn. I just wanted to say hi to the new guy. She blushed and pointed out through my window towards where the entrance to the park would be. Most of the times you can find me at the main headquarters. Sometimes I like to work with the new recruits until they're comfortable with their duties. If you want, I can take you on a little tour when the weather clears up a bit. She was soaking wet. Her hair looked fresh out of the shower. She had to have trekked at least five miles to get here. Through heavy rain and terrible conditions, there was no way I would say no to letting her stay a bit. Plus, it was starting to get colder. If she got caught out while it was snowing with soaked clothing, chances are it wouldn't end well. You can stay here for a bit if you'd like. I just woke up a few minutes ago. I was looking for a manual on how to use a phone because I had a couple questions. I can't find any phone numbers or any information about how to contact the headquarters. I said, pointing towards the phone. She chuckled and replied, Oh, those phones don't work. They're really just an aesthetic at this point. The lines used to be up and running, but now they're good as dead. You'd have to walk down to the headquarters to ask, but since I'm here, you may as well ask me. I felt embarrassed to ask about the notes and the notepad, so I quickly put together a random thought. What do we do about getting food here? Do they do supply runs? To resupply the towers, or do you have to walk to pick up your own? I mean, it wasn't a bad question at all. Besides, I was getting hungry and couldn't find any food around the room. They'll bring it by in a few hours, he said, smiling. It's not exactly what I'd call comfort food, but it fills the stomach and gives you the energy you need to keep trekking. I smiled, thinking back to all the times that I'd gone hungry because I couldn't afford to eat. I wasn't eager to tell Autumn my entire life story, so I stayed silent but the prospect of getting food handed to me and decent, livable food made me livid with excitement. By the way, EHQ told me to tell you that there was an incident on one of the trails not too far from here. Since it's in your territory, they want you to check it out. Something about a boulder that's obstructing the path. I guess it became dislodged with the rain and rolled down the hill. I didn't realize how long it had been raining. I guess it had to have started while I was sleeping, since there was a steady pour by the time I awoke. I'll check it out when the weather clears up. Do you know where it is? It's west of here. If you look on the map in your handbook, you'll see a trail called Boulder Ridge Loop. It's a seven-mile loop trail that goes around a mountain. I laughed. Ironic. Huh. The boulder destroyed the Boulder Ridge Loop. Do you know exactly how much more rain we're going to get tonight? She shook her head. Not sure, to be honest. Chances are it'll get light for a few hours, then start raining pretty heavily again. If I were you, when it starts to ease, I would head out as fast as you can and try to assess what happened. She paused for a moment, then continued. I'd be more than happy to tag along if you'd like the company. 
to help, plus it might be difficult to determine the trailheads on your first full day. That sounds great. I'm going to get changed and start getting ready so we can leave in an instant. She started walking towards the door and said, I'll wait near the trailhead. Don't dilly-dally too long, buddy. She gave me a friendly wave and jogged down the metal steps. Autumn seemed like a nice person. She was pretty attractive, friendly, and seemed knowledgeable. I put on a heavy rain jacket that was in my locker when I realized something. I sprinted over to the desk and grabbed the memo pad. Turning back to page one, I traced the scratched letters with my fingertip. One, you work alone. I flipped the page again. Two, she will not help you. I started to panic. I couldn't go out with her. I'd already broken two of the rules that were in the memo pad. There was no way for me to reach the ranger station to ask them for clarification. I tried to be rational. Maybe she doesn't work with me and she's just telling me my duties. I thought, trying to alleviate the anxiety from my mind, but it didn't help at all. I spent about an hour pacing back and forth, back and forth, until I noticed that the rain had started to lighten up. I began to pace faster and faster looking through drawer upon drawer, trying to find something that could help me. Maybe a mobile phone or a map so I could find the trail myself, or keys to some truck that was out of plain sight nearby. I couldn't find anything. Hours and hours passed until I noticed that the sky was getting darker and darker. God damn it, I thought to myself. I didn't get a chance to do anything today except worry. I turned the light on with a switch in the cabin and went back over to look through the handbook, once again hoping that I missed something that would help me in this situation, but I found nothing new. I looked outside and could see nothing once again. There was a heavy fog all around the tower, and it was pitch black out. It must have been at least 10 p.m. I was considering calling it a night and trying to get some sleep when I heard a faint voice call out from the bottom of the tower. Hey, are you coming? Oh, God, she's back, I thought to myself. I had the pistol on my waist, but grabbed a hunting rifle. Something was very off about this place, about Autumn. At first I thought I could trust her, but at this point I didn't know if I could trust anybody. I started to crawl slowly towards the door. I put my back against the thin frame of metal that separated the door and the wide glass window and peered out. I saw Autumn standing at the base of the tower, staring up at me. Her eyes were wide as saucers, and she was smiling. Not your typical smile. This smile was dark, twisted, scary. It didn't quiver one bit, and she didn't lose her gaze once, even when I looked away. Hello! I heard her call out. I peeked again, and she was now looking to the left, no longer right at me. I reached for the door and slowly creaked it open when I heard it. I heard her begin wailing. Not your typical. I stubbed my toe on a coffee table wail. Her screams were piercing. It was impossible to think straight. Even the constant pour of rain couldn't drown out her wailing. I remembered the third number in the memo pad and began to shake. Three. If you hear her crying, run. I swung open the door and started to run down when her gaze immediately locked onto me. Her eyes had turned pure white and she immediately stopped wailing and smiled once more. Saliva dripped down from her teeth, and she began to laugh as she locked her eyes with mine. And if that wasn't bad enough, blood began to pour out of her eyes. I'm not talking a little bit. It, it was running down her face and collecting in the collar of her ranger jacket. Her once beautiful hair was beginning to fall out by the second, and she began to tremble uncontrollably, as if she was about to explode. Four. If she sees you, it's too late. In a split second, I drew my hunting rifle. She began to sprint the stairs faster than any animal I'd ever encountered. Her steps were effortless and didn't stumble one bit. I immediately aimed at her and fired. A bullet hit her right in the chest, and I saw her smiling corpse fall through the cracks between the metal steps. A pool of blood erupted from her body, and she lay motionless. I sprinted back into the tower, leaving my rifle on the deck, and slammed the door shut. With all the strength I had left, I pushed the filing cabin against the metal cabin door, and immediately collapsed against the cold metal as I listened to the rain drum against the roof of my tower. 
I was in shock, drained, exhausted, confused, and afraid. I don't know what that thing was, but it would bother me no more. I felt a wave of relief rush over me. All I had to do was make it to morning. I could get to the ranger headquarters and get the F out of this place, out of this cursed forest, out of this shitty metal tower, away from this demonic creature that called itself Autumn. That brings us to the present moment. I'm sitting here, phone in my hand, writing this up on my notepad app. However, I just need to check something. I remembered the title of the memo pad said that there weren't four things, but five. I glanced over at the title of the memo pad. As I expected, it read five most important things. I thumbed through the pages. One, you work alone. Two, she will not help you. Three, if you hear her crying, run. Four, if she sees you, it's too late. I paused for a moment, then turned the page once more. Simultaneously, as I turned the page, I heard that familiar pounding of feet sprinting up the stairs. Heavy, heavy feet, and the sobbing was back somehow twice as loud as it was before. I looked at the words on page five and dropped the memo pad to the floor in fear. Five, do not try to kill her under any condition. She does not die. It was the summer of 2015, and I was in 12th grade. Me and two other friends went on the camping trip in Alberta, Canada. The drive up was normal. We got to the campsite, and oh yeah, one of my friends, who we will call Jeff, brought his girlfriend, who we will call Jane. Some, when we pulled up to our camp spot, we unloaded our gear, then had lunch, and then we went on for a hike. Around 3 o'clock, we came back around 5. Fifteen, and for about four hours, we sat around the campfire telling stupid stories and other stuff like that. But this is when shit gets too real. We started to get the feeling we were being watched, which is weird because there was no one around us for about a whole kilometer. So we thought it just might be a fellow camper. So I yelled out, hey, but no response. So we just ignored it. Later that night, I to the sound of snapping twigs. I looked out of the tent curiously, and what I saw was a creature about 20 meters away from the tent. It was about 8 feet tall, with nut-brown hair, and that's all I could really see in the moonlight. So I woke up my friend, and he went pale. He slowly closed the tent zipper and looked at me and said, It's right outside. I told them that's impossible, because it was just 20 meters away. To start out, my name is Doe, and my father and I are what you would call avid hunters, and we know what is in the woods where we hunt. Well, we took a trip to West Virginia to go black bear hunting. I was back at the camper, resting from the early morning bear hunt, and my father went out to go hunting for the afternoon. I knew where he would be in case of an emergency. Well, he gets to his spot and stays there till the sun sets, and then he starts to head back to the side. By side, he took out to get to his spot. On his way back, he heard footsteps, and remember, this is in the mountains where only hunters and rare locals know where they're at. The footsteps he heard were nothing human or bare. He stopped for a second and kept walking, and then the most blood-curdling yet powerful yell came from behind him. He thought, so this is how it ends. Well, it will be a hell of a race if he gets to the side by side. As soon as he got in, something came running up at him and threw a giant rock at him. My father came back to the camper. I was waiting for him, and that was the first time I ever saw my father scared. He didn't come out of the camper until it was time to leave, and we left with no further incident whenever we returned. My brother and I had an encounter while driving that I will never forget. Not a week goes by that I do not think about the encounter, what it was, or the significance. I have subsequently searched for local or regional reports of similar experiences or sightings matching our confrontation and came across your website. 
At the time of the event, I lived with my brother, and we liked to go food shopping at night to avoid the crowds. It was a cloudless and brightly moonlit fall night in October 2011, and we liked to drive around with the windows and sunroof open with the heat blasting while breathing in the crisp, cool Pennsylvania fall air. We had a vehicle full of groceries while taking a long way home. I'd turned off Route 329 in North Whitehall Township, Lehigh County, onto Cobbler Road, a road I do not recall ever driving down before. I had heard the sound of wings flapping through the sunroof and above the car, and immediately figured it was an owl, egret, or blue heron, but instead I saw something much larger as it flew parallel to the car, and then looked out and up the front windshield and looked it in its dead black eyes. It was a man with dangling human legs, torso and arms, and a huge bat-style wingspan, the width of the roadway. I can only describe the appearance as gray-like in a dead, lifeless face with no expression. It didn't look real. The hair on my back and arms were standing on end, and I kept thinking to myself that this is something I am not supposed to see, and this can't be real. As we continued along the road, our interaction with the being was only a few seconds before it veered to the left and ascended the hill. As we continued along Cobbler Road until we came to the intersection of Cobbler and Bellevue, and I stopped the car and watched it continue to flap its wings as it continued on its path. I remember repeating to my brother, What is that? What is that? Repeatedly as the wing flapping looked unnatural and almost robotic. My brother said, Follow it, but I refused as every instinct I had told me to flee, and this was something I was not supposed to see. I briskly made a ride on Bellevue and headed home. The whole interaction lasted 30 seconds tops. At the time, I had a poor quality BlackBerry camera and didn't even think to try and take a photo or video. The moment was terrifying, and my flight response overcame any other scent. After researching the area, I found that the building we had just passed as our interaction began was an old abandoned slaughterhouse. I did not know if that had any significance, nor was I unaware it even existed. I have a few links to that particular facility. I have a master's degree in engineering, so naturally I search for a prosaic answer based on logic and reason, hence why my brain initially went to a large bird like an owl, egret, or blue heron, but it wasn't. We know what we saw, and it was a winged man just a few feet away. I was camping in upstate New York many years ago. I was having trouble sleeping in the tent, so I got up and got in the car. After some time passed, I had a very strange feeling I was being watched. The hairs on my neck were standing up. I slowly look up and out of the passenger window, maybe 30 feet away. I see a tall humanoid figure, unnaturally tall. Long arms, long skinny fingers, pale skin, and a stretched out ghoulish looking face. Although it wasn't looking at me directly, I had the distinct feeling that it was aware of my presence and stalking me. I was pretty much frozen in fear. I didn't want to make any sudden movements, but I was able to slowly duck into the floorboard and hide until morning. I was a sailor in the United States Navy for four years. During my time out at sea, I had seen some interesting things. First, I was an aviation ordnanceman on a gun mount in the Arabian Gulf. There were two instances of two separate things that had happened. First off, which at the end doesn't end up too creepy, but I thought I'd share it anyways. While on gun mount watch from balls to four, we were watching into the sea to see several streaks of water coming towards the ship. Like these streaks reminded me of when you see torpedoes in the movies and the streaks in the water that they leave behind. Seen these through night vision goggles. Turns out they were whales. The second is pretty busy. So when on your balls to four watch, you have to even look in the air for possible air assaults. As we are looking at the sky, there seems to be a satellite or something similar. 
looking like it was orbiting the Earth. The Fantail gun mount says Mount 50. When do you see that object in the sky? Looks like it's right above us. I seen it and confirmed to the other mount that I had seen it. They told us to watch that object. About three minutes of watching this object, it speeds up and heads towards the bow of the ship, immediately changes direction and shoots towards the fan tail and disappears. Within ten seconds, all the gun mounts were calling into the bridge about this object, freaked us out. This was maybe August of 2011. Hey, everyone. Gonna start by saying I generally don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts, etc. But I have been working in this school for just over a year now, and my perspective is beginning to get changed. I don't know if this is the right place to tell this in. If it is not, please guide me to the correct one. I think I'll start by just explaining the school. It's based in London and is a very old school that has been here for almost 100 years. The school is massive, three floors and loads of classes or rooms, etc. So my first experience started with something completely small or insignificant, but made me think more. I am a PE teacher in the school, and I was in the school for a holiday club. This means there was nobody in the school other than me and my team and the children we were working with. The children are not allowed upstairs or anywhere without us. What happened was I was outside coaching, and I looked up to the third floor, and there was papers in the room fluttering in front of the windows. Now, this could obviously be explained by a draft or open window, of course. The strange thing is that at this point we had no access to the school top floors, and they are locked and alarmed. The alarm will go off if any windows and doors are open. The main thing that happened to make me think happened two days ago. I was walking upstairs to my office in the second floor. We now have access to all floors. And I heard a person whistling, like full-on whistling. This whistling stopped as soon as I came off the stairs, and just a reminder, there is nobody in the school. Apart from my team, and definitely nobody on the second floor. The next thing is that I left my office and walked to the second floor staff room, which is directly across from my office, and on that walk I heard a child laugh and giggle. There is absolutely no way any children were on the second floor, and no way I heard it was from downstairs. There has been other strange occurrences, but this is the first time I've really been unable to debunk it. My dad was on an aircraft carrier during Vietnam, and he and his buddies used to go sit against the wheels of the aircraft on deck and waste time at night. He reports there was a really bright light far off in the distance. He thought was a star or planet, but all of a sudden it moved really quickly and hovered off the side of the ship next to them for a few moments. Then it took off and was completely out of sight within a second. He loves to tell the story of his UFO experience. No probes here, people. Merely a very fast, bright ball of light. Get it. Now that I saw the post about ball lightning, I'm thinking that may have been it. Having my dad check out the YouTube videos to confirm. Response from my dad. Well, I watched the video, and it's possible that is what we saw. It came down like a falling star with a tail on it, and then stopped about a mile above the ocean got larger and went parallel with our ship for about five or six seconds. Then it got small again like it was going straight away from us, turned right and went out of sight in a matter of a few seconds. It was like supersonic speed. This says they are usually associated with thunderstorms. Ours was on a perfectly clear night. However, we were just off of the Philippines and it was super hot and humid. You might have solved the mystery, though. Thanks for the enlightenment. Love you. There are a series of events in my childhood home, mostly at night. I'll name a few. Once I was going downstairs at around 1 a.m. Everyone was asleep except me. I woke up for a drink. 
I went downstairs, opened the fridge, and while I was holding the fridge open, I placed my phone with a flashlight on the table. I felt something grabbing my hand like an actual touch. I looked while I pulled away, and there was nothing there. I got incredibly scared. I was sure that my brain wasn't playing tricks or anything. I was sure. So I ran upstairs and left my phone there. Another incident was when I was much younger, also around. 1 a.m., my twin sister and I were up. The door was directly facing the bed, and we were playing on her bed with the lights all out and everyone else asleep. Suddenly, the light goes on, and we see a shadow directly under the door. We thought it was our parents. Then the light goes out, and we take a slight peek with our tablets in our hands. Using the flash, there was nothing there, and we didn't hear any sound of anyone leaving or even in the house. We could also hear sounds downstairs quite a bit at night. Our parents never experienced any of this, and when we asked them about it, they never knew anything about who was downstairs. My sister could hear it, too. These are the more major incidents. We don't have any signs of them anymore, but I also had quite a few nightmares. This happened in a school forest field trip in 7th grade in Sweden. So we were playing a game called Ten, which is one dude as a warden, that everyone touches on its back every round while the warden don't look. Then the other kids hide and the warden gets ten steps and then counts down from thirty. After multiple rounds, the warden counts from ten. Yada yada. Yada. Here is the happening. I was just running from the warden after wrapping its back during a countdown, and it was lots of tall and big trees. And I was at a somewhat of a drop down dirt path. It was about a one meter drop and I could not see past this drop due to the extreme greenness of the trees. But I ran down there anyways, and just as I go to look up after dropping down, I hear something behind the trees. It sounded awful and terrifying, so I looked to my left, and about three meters from me. I saw a two, three meter tall black figure. That figure was a male moose that was dead eye staring at me. So we made eye contact, and the moose just started to look upset, if that makes sense. It was not happy about me. So I literally backed up that dirt drop as slow as I could, and then ran like a mother trucking cheetah. Scary part is that two weeks after, that exact moose chased my friend on a bike while in a suburban area where we live, and the moose was just one subway sandwich away from him, about 30 centimeters. So my friend was close to his doom, just biking to school. And the moose had been reported as effing aggressive in our community Facebook group, Creepy Stuff. I was swimming in a lake alone, and I felt someone watching me. I went back to the bank to get my glasses and saw some dude walking through the woods towards me. Something went off in my brain, and I just took my shit and ran. Dude also starts running, and I just sprinted headlong back down the trail, about 100 yards to a parking lot, where there were other people. Turn around, heart pounding. There is no one behind me. Fight or flight switch tripped hard. I encountered a bipedal wolf-like creature here in western Michigan, and it's got me spooked. I was out shoveling snow, as it's common here in my state. My encounter happened in a place just south of Rothbury, Michigan. I decided to take a walk in my family's woods one day. That's when my life changed forever. My family owns 270 acres of land here in the town or city of Montague, Michigan. I ventured out into those woods, as I've done many times, one hundreds of them. The walk started as anyone would. I started to follow the creek south to check for deer stands on our property. The walk went as planned until I got about 300 yards south of the house. I stopped to have a cigarette. My eyes started to wander as I scoped for deer or coyote. As I gazed back and forth, I noticed this figure and froze. I literally froze. This thing made eye contact with me and then stood up. It was hairy, 
had very broad shoulders and amber-colored eyes. It let out a growl unlike any other I've heard. This wolf, as I call it, made two leaps and was gone. The most surprising thing about this encounter was how silent the woods were. Up to when I had my encounter. So that you know, your episode 80 is what made me want to talk about this. Hello, I live here in rural West Michigan in the town of Montague. It is located in northern Muskegon County. I've had three different encounters with a wolf-like creature. The first encounter took place on, or about February 2, 2016, 4, 38 a.m. I was shoveling the driveway as it was snowing heavily and needed it cleared for the propane delivery. There are woods all around, but this encounter took place in the woods to the south. As I was about halfway done with the shoveling when I heard a splash in the creek, I thought it was a deer I'd spooked. So I stopped and started to scan the woods and creek. Then all of a sudden this huge, and I mean huge, wolf-like creature leapt into the air and took off with a supersonic burst of speed to the west. It crossed the road and continued west. I heard branches snapping right and left. I stood there absolutely frozen in total shock and amazement at what I'd just seen. The second encounter took place on April 11, 2016, 3, 15 p.m. I was a bit shaken up by the first encounter that this was my first trip back into the woods since. I was walking the property, which consists of about 30 acres of mainly hardwood and creek bottom. I was crossing the creek headed east when I caught something out of the corner of my eye to the south. I was about 30 to 35 yards from what I thought was a black bear. It was tearing profusely at the west bank of the creek. Then it stood up and I froze. It turned around and stood up on its hind legs. This was at least seven half feet tall. I was in the middle of the creek and was absolutely shitting myself. I didn't want to run out of fear it would give chase and the firearm I had brought didn't stand a chance against this thing. Then all of a sudden it put its nose straight up into the air and sniffed a couple of times. It looked immediately to the east, looked back at me, and with two huge strides took off into the thicket headed east. After it cleared the thicket it jumped into the trees and was leaping from treetop to treetop. And this one had all black fur that was matted and smelled horrendous, like rotten guts and sour fruit. The first wolf-like creature I saw was a grayish color with a little white in it. They both had pointed ears and a snout, a number of jagged-looking teeth and tails. The second one had much longer claws than the first one did. The third and final encounter came May 2, 2016, 9, 20 p.m. I was collecting some kindling from the wood line south of the house. I had just about finished when I heard a loud snap. I stopped and listened for any movement. I'm on the wood line, not in the woods. I'm too frightened to step foot in them. Then I heard rustling sounds and another snap. This one sounded like a bone, not a branch. The sounds intensify, so I click on my flashlight. I started to scan the distance. As I get about halfway, I see glistening eyes yellow in color about 25 yards in front of me. I kept my light on it. It snarled and let out this deep growling sound that literally shook me. I started to back up, and again, this thing stood up and bent over to pick something up. I kept the light on it. It picked up what is was after, turned around and looked at me like I had interrupted something it was doing, and just walked off into the woods to the south and disappeared. The next day, I had my cousin walk out with me to where the creature stood. What we found was the hide, and only the hide of a white-tailed deer. I truly believe that the creature I saw was responsible for this. It was skinned like something just gag a creature I saw. Reminds me of a werewolf. In my three encounters, the one thing that freaks me out is how eerily silent it got before my encounters. I have since found out that the property has many Indian burial grounds on it, heavily wooded with a freshwater creek running through entire property. I used to walk the woods four times a week, and since my encounter, I have a very hard time walking the wood line, let alone the woods themselves.
I was a part of a Navy SEAL team called SACOP Recon. If you know anyone who was a Navy SEAL, they'll tell you they never heard of us, which is by design. They'll think you mean Spec Ops. We're above that. Spec Ops guys don't even know we exist. The team operates within special access programs, all of which are programs and projects that have the highest security clearance the United States government uses. I can't tell you any of the things I worked on, and I wouldn't if I could. Let's just say that if the military or an intel group needed to see or do anything underwater that no one could know about, and that also required knowledge of technologies and information that even regular SEALs aren't cleared to have access to, they'd send us in. Our job was to survey the site in detail, not like you see on National Geographic where they do some sonar scans and sit back and write a paper about it and pat themselves on the back. They take years, sometimes decades, to do what we have to do in a few days. We map out every inch of the area with high-quality sonar, infrared, visible light, X-ray, backscatter microwave, and a few things I can't mention. By the time we're done, if there's a dime sitting buried in the sand on the ocean floor, you can find it in our data. Our work is quickly processed and handed over to our sister team called SACOP Strike. Normal SEAL teams call these guys fire teams. They do everything from sabotage, disarming mines, to underwater combat. Yes, combat. Actual underwater combat. They have special weapons designed to work underwater, and I'm not talking about mere knives and spear guns. Anyway, it was 2013, and we were sent to the Baltic Sea with orders to check out something that had recently been found on the ocean floor by some sunken treasure hunters. It's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. The Swedish government had quietly shut the treasure hunter's study of the object down and made them sign national security oaths to keep their mouths shut and play it off like they can't find funding for further expedition. Meanwhile, they called the United States for assistance. They have their own divers, of course. But this thing was shutting down any and all electronics that came within 200 feet of it. They were stumped. The object itself was located about 300 feet below the surface and was just sitting there on the ocean floor. It was almost perfectly round except for a few sections that looked as if they had been cut out. It had the basic shape of that ship Han Solo flew in the Star Wars movies, the Millennium Falcon. The treasure hunter's original sonar image had been published before the Swedes had the situation under control so the public was already theorizing it to be a UFO. It was not. The object sat at the end of a long trail in the sand that stretched out on the bottom and into a ravine that appeared to be cut out of a small undersea mountain. This gave the impression to some that this was a crash landing scar on the ocean floor where the object had slid to a stop upon its sinking. It was not. I was looking forward to the challenge of performing a reconnaissance mission without the aid of electronics. We brought a few devices with us just in case, but were fully prepared and expecting not to be able to use them. We even had underwater flares in case our lights shut off. Our mission was simple. Determine the basic nature of the object and survey its exterior in detail. This sounds easier than it is, especially without cameras and electronics. To determine the nature of the object, we use the null hypothesis approach. This is where you try to rule things out by attempting to disprove your hypothesis. In this case, we were acting on the hypothesis that the formation was natural in origin. Was it sandstone or a buildup of sediment that just happened to form a shape that coincidentally looked like a construction? Deep down, and I was thinking it was probably some Y equipment that had been scuttled or blasted off of a ship during the war. Maybe the base of a large ship-mounted gun. But why would it be knocking electronics out? And how? At any rate, all of us were geologists, marine biologists, and oceanographers, so we knew exactly what to look for. I know that might sound odd to you. You have to understand that knowing what we are doing in all situations that we might encounter is what the military was paying for. 
You are not deployed in our group without these skills. If you don't want to do the schooling, stay in the regular SEALs. In addition to our skills, that our team only had two squads of three men, each and no commanding officers. All six of us were officers of equal rank. We designed the missions ourselves and operated with extreme self-discipline. If you need an officer to tell you what to do, then you aren't fit for our kind of work. The Navy learned the hard way a long time ago that a commanding officer's ego can ruin a mission in certain circumstances. And while it might be necessary to have one when the men under him need that to perform, in the case of SECOP missions, they only get in the way and risk lives and mission failure, and we did not fail at our missions. It wasn't allowed. Teams in the old days had to keep shanking their commanding officers to ensure mission success, and finally the Navy just started letting us do our thing. My squad was going to start by taking samples of the surface material that had settled or otherwise built up on the object. We would drill through it with diamond-tipped hand-powered drills. We had to determine what the object beneath was composed of. We do this with the aid of special chemistry test kits we had, which were designed to work in ocean water. Remember, we couldn't use spectrometers because electronics were useless. The other team was going to examine every inch of the thing, looking for signs of manufacturing. Both teams would also create a map of the object's magnetic field and variance. If there was any, using only handheld compasses and underwater pencil. Yes, we were that good. We began our dive when the sun was exactly 45 degrees above the horizon. This would provide enough light so we wouldn't need to use our flares for most of the day. We didn't bring air tanks except small ones for emergencies and instead had hoses coming from the surface supported by airbags every 50 feet. This would allow us to stay down as long as we needed. The strike team was topside in the boat, making sure the air pumps were working and preparing for whatever they might have to do once we came back with our assessment. They weren't expecting to have to do anything, as we all assumed that this was either a piece of wartime hardware or an ancient ruin, but they were prepared anyway. They always were. On the way down, I noticed there were no fish or life of any kind in the waters around us. Usually, that time of year, you could find flounder, herring, cod, and other species of fish swimming about. Maybe it was an odd coincidence, but I found it noteworthy just the same. As we approached the object, a strange feeling came over us. It was an unusual feeling for us all. It was mild fear and apprehension. We had all been in much more dangerous situations than this before, and we were trained not to fear. We didn't fear death, injury, or even drowning, yet all of us reported this same sensation. We wore special dive masks that covered our entire faces so we could speak to each other. Sam travels well in the water, and so as long as we were close enough, we could all discuss what we needed to. We agreed to continue the mission in spite of this feeling, but to make sure we kept each other aware of any increase in feelings of duress that we might experience. We soon arrived at the object and split up into our respective squads. Up close, the object was clearly not a natural formation, but we would go through our process anyway to be thorough. The object was somewhat flat on top, except for a small, perfectly smooth dome on the right side. To the left side, there was a stairway going up to the flat top. The right angles and straight lines on the object had been dismissed as a rare but real natural phenomena that occurs due to the molecular nature of certain types of stone combined with water erosion from tides and currents. But here the stairs were sandwiched between flat stone walls on both sides, which would prevent water from moving in the necessary directions, to erode the stairs into the perfect steps that they were. I chipped off a small chunk of the material on the side of the structure and put it into my test kit's receptacle, squeezed some chemicals into the enclosure, and shook it. I already knew, but the resulting color of the mixture verified that the object was indeed covered with a thick layer of silt and sand that had built up, compacted, and hardened over time. It must have taken a long time to get into the state. It was in because that part of the Baltic Sea didn't have a lot of turbulent water or natural silt.
I got the drill out and turned the hand crank as the bit sunk into the caked on silt and sand. It went down about four inches when it hit the underlying structure. I withdrew the drill, blew the silt out of the hole with a turkey baster type of device we use, and looked in. I recognized the material right away. It was coarse grained granite, pink, black, and white specks together. The surface of the object wasn't just made from granite which shouldn't be found at the bottom of the sea, but it was polished granite, perfectly flat and smooth. I cleared off some more of the compacted sand covering the area and showed it to my team. Brent and David, both of whom were busy mapping the magnetic variants of the object. David swam over to the other squad to inform them of the discovery while Brent showed me the map they had made thus far. It was unbelievable. They drew on a plastic sheet that had a sketch of the object on it with a special kind of grease pencil that worked underwater. The lines they drew around it represented the distance from the object where the magnetic field the object emitted varied from standard north or south, and each line had a number on it indicating how many degrees off from the expected compass reading it was at that point. According to the map, the object was pulling the compass needle a full 45 degrees away from magnetic north towards itself. This effect was not present at the surface as we had checked before descending. Just then David swam back over and told us that the other squad had found something that we needed to see. We met them behind the object where the bottom of the structure met the ocean floor. The men had discovered a small doorway. My squad volunteered to go inside. We removed our airlines and hooked up our emergency air tanks, each containing about a half hour of air. It was dark inside the passageway and so I lit up a flare. We were in a hallway that led back towards the front of the object, but underneath it, the walls had less silt on them and we could wipe it off with our hands down to the polished granite. About halfway back the passageway ramped upward and we walked up and out of the water into a large room inside the structure. The room was dark and cold. My flare lit the walls and ceiling, revealing the same polished granite as the outside. There were engravings in the stone wall every four feet or so. The ceiling was about twelve feet from the floor. The room was a half circle in shape and had three granite tables that resembled altars a little bit, one on each side of the ramp and one behind it. The rest of the room was bare. I tried to turn on my flashlight and, as expected, it did not work. David started sketching the images on the engravings which appeared to me to be depictions of human sacrifice. In the images, the rituals were taking place on the top exterior of the very structure we were inside. It was clear from the scenes depicted that this building wasn't always underwater. Either the oceans had risen since it was in use, or the land had sunken. Brent pulled me over to one of these engravings and pointed. There in the image was some creature devouring the sacrifice. The men in the scene weren't sacrificing people to some deity. They were feeding a monster. It was like a man in that it had two legs and feet. However, at the waist, it appeared to have about a dozen tentacles coming off its body, but no arms. It did have a head, though, but it looked more like a giant mouth gaping open with a large teeth. The thing had large feathers coming off its back and the top of its head as well. I've never seen anything like it depicted before. However, there are some Aztec and pre-Columbian figures that are similar in a few ways. Brent and I quickly measured the room's dimensions and did a walkthrough covering every square foot of the place. We found a stone door that appeared as though it was supposed to rotate on a central shaft. However, we could not get it to budge. We discovered a stairwell that descended downward, but not back into the water. This went down into stone. We surmised that the structure had been built on top of an even larger rock or mountain that was now buried by the seafloor. We descended the stone stairwell, which was not made of the same granite as the upper chamber. Instead, this material looked like standard seafloor basalt. The stairs ended about 40 feet down into a small antechamber. There were some relics on the floor there, a spear and a set of ankle shackles. Both appeared completely oxidized to the point where they would probably disintegrate upon our attempting to pick them up. 
The room had an opening that led into a huge cavern, which was lit by an abundance of bioluminescent algae, which coated much of the cave walls, as well as a small river that flowed in and out of a set of pools. The water glowed a bright aqua color from this algae, which made the water cloudy and opaque. There were large quartz crystals embedded in the rock, along with iron pyrite and veins of gold. The view was spectacular. We wondered aloud what had been in those shackles. We suspected it was the creature from the engravings, or perhaps a sacrificial victim. There were footpaths that ran between the rock and stalagmites that formed the floor of the cavern. We split up and each proceeded down different paths, giving ourselves exactly ten minutes' time to meet back at the foot of the stairwell. Our air would be running out by then, and we weren't going to risk trying to breathe the ancient air down there. We'd have to head back soon. We took air, water, and sand samples, as well as photographs using old-fashioned non-electronic cameras loaded with a special film designed for low light. The cavern seemed to go back at least 300 feet, with a ceiling around 30 feet high, the width I estimated in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 feet. I could hear water pouring into water coming from the rear of the cave, and so I headed back to ascertain whether or not there was some kind of waterfall back there someplace. I rounded a bend in the footpath and saw the source of the sound. A two-foot diameter flow of water was pouring out of the sidewall of the cave about 20 feet up, arcing into a pool that was recessed in the floor. Behind the waterfall, there were several skeletons chained up to the back wall. I started to take some photos of this when I felt something wrap around my right ankle. Looking down, I beheld a black tentacle protruding up out of the pool, which had wrapped around my lower leg several turns. I instinctively pulled my leg away, but it tightened its grip as I did so. I sounded a distress call from a noise-making device. We each carried on our wetsuit as I struck the tentacle with my fist in the hope it might release me. It pulled back a bit, which caused me to fall onto my back. I reached for my rock pick as the thing rose up out of the water. It was hideous. It used its tentacles for support on the black, rocky ground. Its head was like an octopus, only the mouth was front-facing. It growled, baring what reminded me of shark teeth, with several rolls going towards the back of its throat. It started to pull me towards it and lift me up off the ground when Brent reached me, with David not far behind. He struck the tentacle that held me with his rock pick, letting loose a glowing, aqua-colored fluid from the creature's flesh. It immediately dropped me and turned its attention to Brent. Its saucer-sized, amber eyes twitched back and forth as it examined him a moment before it lashed out with two of its tentacles. As it did, both of these appendages projected long, thin, sharp, white-ribbed rods from their tips which pierced Brent's torso. The creature then lifted him up and pulled him in towards its gaping and shrieking mouth. David had arrived at my location by then and began to drag my body backwards away from the thing as it put Brent's head into its mouth and closed it in a circular fashion around his neck where its teeth cut through Brent's wetsuit and flesh. He flayed around, trying to break free for a moment before the creature had bitten his head clean off. We could only watch and take a few photos from a distance as it used its tentacles to peel back his wetsuit and munch on Brent's body like a human would when detailing a shrimp. I got to my feet as David announced that we needed to let the strike team handle it. The two of us headed for the stairwell as fast as we could. Before we could get there, the creature swam along the river next to us and jumped out of the water tackling David while thrusting its pointy rods through him, just like it did to Brent. David and the beast fell over sideways, and it proceeded to feed on him. It did so with such ferocity and speed that I had no time to try to save him. All I could do was run and take advantage of the fact that it would be stalled from killing me for a minute as it feasted on David. I glanced back as I ran and saw that the creature had put David's lifeless body down and had begun to pursue me. I guess it didn't want to lose any of that rare human meal it had discovered. I suppose it had been feeding on the algae in the water for so long that the taste of blood once again after all these years was too much for it to resist. 
Just as I was reaching the opening into the small chamber where the stairwell was, the thing flung itself at me, and I landed on my back. I had my rock pick in hand by then, so I started to bang its pointed tip into the meat of one of the monster's tentacles. It withdrew it, but as it did, the thing wrapped its body around my upper torso and pressed its flesh against the back of my neck, where I could feel tiny bristle, like hairs stick into my spine. Like little needles, they inserted deep into my nervous system, where the creature hijacked my motor control. It used this method to couple with my brain, and our minds became one mind. I knew its entire history, thoughts, and experiences. I understood its deepest motivations and desires, and it knew mine. It used my legs to walk as it rode me like a horse back up the stairwell, into the chamber above, and down the ramp to the open sea outside. It hadn't been out of the cavern in over a millennia as it needed a human host to climb the stairs. I could feel its excitement as we exited the structure and proceeded to kill the three men in the other squad who had been waiting for our return. Knowing the lethality of the strike team, it opted to steal an inflatable motorized raft and sink the boat by having me chip a hole in the hull with my rock pick. The sound of my doing this alerted the seals inside to our presence and two of them entered the water to check it out as we sped off in the raft. I got an oversized trench coat to hide the creature on my back so I could move about among the masses without causing a stir. I haven't checked in with the Navy in several weeks now and am currently sitting in a cheap hotel room in Barcelona typing this. While I would like to be rid of this thing, I also have to admit that I feel its pleasure at the taste of human blood and meat. Our minds have become one, and, and I'm as much it as I am me. I know the military will have sent a wet team to track me down by now, and I know they will probably eventually find me. I have to stay on the move. The trail of dead will soon give away my whereabouts, as the method of the kills is unique and leaves its own signature. I'm putting this story online as a last-ditch effort to get a message through to my dear mother, Jane, the only person I still feel connected to and whom I miss dearly. I love you, Mom. I'm sorry about all of this, and maybe someday, if I'm lucky, we can meet again. I've already left too many bodies here, so I'm leaving Barcelona tonight before daybreak. But first, I feed again. It was October 8th of 2010, and we're going bear hunting up by Golden Lake. It was just another day. We'd hunted most of the day, unproductive. We found one small buck, and we said it's a young deer. Let's let this one grow up, so we passed on that deer. Then we ended up going into another area, and we're coming around the corner. It's probably 5 o'clock. We came around this corner. Well, it's not really a corner, it's kind of like an open field, but it's a blind corner because you can't see past these trees. So it opens up into a field. We both look and see this thing at the same exact time. The truck stops. I pointed my rifle at it, and I could see it through the scope. I had my scope on 16 power. I could see it pretty clearly. Everybody asked me, well, what was going through your head. Did you think it was a bear? I thought a lot of things. It wasn't that I was a skeptic. It was that I didn't know that anybody believed in Bigfoot at all. We saw this creature. It was walking on two legs, hairy. The best way I can describe it is it looked like a person in a suit. Probably three or four seconds had gone by and it started to walk towards us. Between 180 yards, somewhere in there, it had its arms in the air and was waving them, almost like don't shoot. Don't shoot. Kind of a universal thing in any language. Anybody raises his hands. Sign of surrender. I didn't know what it was. To me, it was just a monster. I didn't know what it was. I'm looking at this monster. By this time, I have the bullet in the chamber, my finger on the trigger, and it's coming towards us slowly. It's taking steps, waving. A lot of people are saying I shot it in the back, so if you have a deer and you shoot it behind the shoulder, then you're going to penetrate both lungs. On a person, it's a hard area to describe, but it's basically right under the shoulder where the lungs are located. 
so maybe five seconds had passed, and my buddy, he says, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's not a bear, do not shoot, and I'm still kind of locked in on this thing. To me, it was a monster, that's all it was. You know, the gun's getting ready to go off. We've hunted together a lot over the years, and we both knew what was going to happen. Normally, when we see something, the truck stops. Both of us get out, and we've got our rifles on it immediately. Well, my buddy was still using his binoculars because he didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to think. I'm looking at this thing, and I'm pretty close to pulling the trigger. I've just been squeezing this whole time. And he's getting louder and louder. He's like, hey, bro, shoot. Don't shoot. There's not a bear. That's a person in a suit. That's a person in a suit. Don't shoot. And I'm thinking, well, if that's a person in a suit, then we've got a real problem here. Because they're walking around during bear season with a fur suit on. Something don't add up about this. I'm halfway thinking in the back of my mind that somebody's going to pull around the corner and it's going to be like a film crew or something. I don't know. My mind's going a hundred miles an hour. But I see this animal, this furry thing, and we're here to hunt. We're here to kill animals, and it was just a monster. So I pull the trigger and you could see dust shoot off the side of it like it obviously made a really good hit. Definitely got it in the lungs. And it took off running. Just then we see two, I guess you'd call them kids or cubs or something, I don't know. The big one's almost out of sight, and these two come right out, and my buddy's like, holy S, really? There's more of them. So we drive the truck into the field as far as we can, maybe 30 yards. Then we take off running. We heard the thing crash, though. It crashed. It sounded like a car wreck. We knew we made a good hit. It's very normal to shoot a deer and have it run 50, 60, 70 yards and expire. So we run up there and my buddy doesn't even grab his gun. I mean, we're just running, trying to run over to this thing and cubs are just out of sight. And we run over there and now we're face to face with these kids. Probably 10 yards away or so and we can't find the big one. So I decide I'm going to shoot one of the kids and my buddy's like, no, do not shoot. Do not shoot. Okay, okay, all right. We'll find the big one. We'll get it, and we'll leave. So we end up looking for 15 minutes or so. Meanwhile, the kids, they're looking for the parent, obviously. They're walking around looking for their parent. We knew we were looking in the right area then. I've made the mistake of shooting a sow, and then the piglets come running out, and they always know right where their mom is. They take it to the body. So we knew that it was right there. We just couldn't find it. It's an extremely brushy area. I mean, we could have looked for two weeks and not found it. So there's blood on the ground. We're kind of looking at the blood. We're walking around. We split up probably 10 or 15 times. He'd go one way, I'd go the other way. And the kids would do the same thing. They'd walk into the center of the open field and they'd say something to each other. It sounded like diff chatter. They'd go, wah, wah, whoa. They'd say something to each other. Then they'd split up. Then about a minute later, they'd come back, almost like you see anything. You see anything? No. Okay. Did you look by that tree? Did you look by the stump? Yeah, I looked by the stump. Did you look by the tree? I'll look by the other tree. They didn't care that we were there. They were not alarmed at all. They were just there. And so, maybe 15 minutes goes by or so, and I keep deciding that I'm going to shoot one of the little ones. It's like we'll shoot one of these, throw it in the back, and we'll figure it out. And my buddy's like, no, no, that's terrible. Don't do that. There's no reason for that. There's absolutely no reason to do this. So at the time, everything's running through my head. I'm thinking if we don't get one of the little ones, nobody's ever going to believe us. It's just going to be a crazy story. We just need to find the big one, and we need to get out of here. So eventually, me and my buddy are split up, and I'm down this hill, and it's almost like straight uphill, maybe 15 yards away, maybe 20, and one of them, the little one, is starting to approach me. It's getting closer. It's getting closer, starting to make some noise like the deaf chatter thing. It's getting closer, and I was thinking, 
I don't know what's going to happen here, but he's going to get too close. It's way too close for comfort. Screw it, I'm going to shoot. So I shoot it directly in the neck, because I didn't want to mess up the skull or the face. And it rolled down the hill, and actually, it hit my feet. Starts bleeding on my boots. Still alive. So I pick it up, and I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm starting to feel back. I'm starting to realize, what have I done? What have I done? Dad went on for a couple minutes. There was a lot of stuff that happened in there, but to summarize it, make a long story short, it died. And then my buddy walks up, and he's like, what have you done? Seriously, really. And I'm like, fine, forget this. So I throw it on the ground, and I start walking off, walking back to the truck. Then I look back, and my buddy's holding it, just holding it, sitting there, staring at it. So, I walk back to him like, dude, we gotta get out of here. Somebody just heard a shot. You know that somebody's going to show up fishing game. We're going to get in so much trouble. We're going to go to jail. We need to get out of here. This is crazy. Let's go. He says, okay. Okay, let's hide this. We'll come back for it later. We'll come back. So we take it into the bush. Get it as deep as we can. Throw a bunch of stuff on top of it. And then we leave. Not saying a word. We actually drove out of there probably 60 miles an hour on that dirt road. It doesn't make sense, but we were just afraid we were going to get caught, get in trouble, something. So we drove down to Sierraville and we stopped there. Both of us quit smoking in like the last six months. Gross habit. But we both walk in, get a pack of cigarettes without saying a word. And we drive all the way home without saying a word. Smoke the whole thing. Then he dropped me off. A couple of days later, I get on taxidermy. Yep, I've got a few friends on there, and I'm trying to think if there's some way I can talk about what happened. So I make a post, like, So if you saw a Bigfoot, would you shoot it? That's all I said, and everybody's going back and forth. Taxidermists are outdoor people. They've got a fascination with wildlife. They've hunted all their life. There's a bunch of guys one there who were like, Oh, no, I seen one. I seen one. I know they're real. And it turned into this really long topic, so maybe 20 pages goes by, and I get on there, and I just say, I'll tell you what. You can call it X if you want. I don't care. But I shot something that walked on two legs. I was hunting solo on our land when I stumbled across multiple dead deer heads thrown into a creek. I was already jittery hunting as a solo female, knowing we'd been dealing with poachers on the land. While investigating and taking pictures of the dump to call into our game warden, I heard a truck idle for a few seconds, then suddenly peel out of there once I was spotted. I immediately called up the warden instead of waiting until I got home to report my findings. Ohio had been getting hit hard with CWD, and I did know that is was spreading my way. I just remember the first adrenaline spike of stumbling upon the pile, and then again when a, the sound of a truck peeled out. My heart hit my toes, and all I could think was that we both most likely had guns. They knew where I was but I didn't know where they were. When I was out hunting with a friend in western Wisconsin, I didn't expect the day to take such a chilling turn. We had set out early in the morning, full of anticipation, ready to track down a few deer. The woods were serene, the air crisp, and the autumn colors of the leaves created a mesmerizing tapestry above our heads. After hours of waiting in our stand, the sun began its slow descent towards the horizon. As we watched and hoped for any sign of deer, the daylight gradually waned. We knew that our hunt was coming to an end, and we'd have to start our trek back to the cabin. The walk to our stand had been long, a mile and a half of uneven terrain and dense woods. It was tiring, especially after a day of hunting, but our excitement had kept us going. However, on our return, with darkness settling in, 
The forest seemed to transform into a realm of secrets, one we were intruding upon. We walked in silence, the only sounds the crunch of leaves beneath our boots and the occasional hoot of an owl. But then, as if from the depths of a nightmare, we heard it, a blood-curdling scream that sent shivers down my spine. It sounded like a woman in agony, her voice twisted in terror and pain. My friend and I halted in our tracks, our flashlight scanning the darkness for the source of that wretched scream. Our hearts pounded in our chests, and we exchanged anxious glances. That scream was far from ordinary. It sent a chilling wave of dread coursing through our veins. We strained our ears, hoping to hear something that would explain the horrifying sound. But there was nothing. No rustling leaves, no footsteps, no voices, just an eerie silence that felt almost as disturbing as the scream itself. We whispered to each other, questioning what we had just heard, whether it was some sort of prank or a wild animal imitating a human cry. But we both knew, deep down, that what we'd heard was beyond ordinary. With our flashlights trembling, we cautiously moved forward, inching our way back to the cabin. The forest that had felt like a sanctuary earlier in the day now seemed like a realm of dread, hiding its secrets in the shadows. Every snap of a twig or gust of wind sent us into high alert, as we couldn't shake the image of that chilling scream. We finally made it back to the cabin, locking the door behind us and sitting in bewildered silence. We couldn't find an explanation for what we had heard. That scream haunted our thoughts, raising questions without answers. We never did figure out what had happened that evening in the woods of western Wisconsin. The memory of that scream still lingers in the corners of my mind, a reminder of the mysteries that can be hidden deep within the wilderness. Staying at my granddad's farm in Cornwall, United Kingdom, picture big fields, long, narrow lanes of thick trees and bushes, all right next to massive Clifford by the sea. Just finished watching the Hand of the Baskervilles' The Sherlock episode about a massive black dog that kills people. So I finish watching it about 11 p.m. in my granddad's farmhouse. Then I have to walk about one kilometer to the cottage I'm actually sleeping in. As I'm walking down the long lane with my flashlight, start thinking if there's any place where an animal like that could exist. It's probably somewhere like here where it's so remote. Look up and see it's a full moon then. As I look back down, I see two red dots in the distance rushing towards me. Two eyes. Can tell it's some animal and the eyes are like a meter off the ground, so I know it's no small farm cat or something. Lost my shit and just froze. So it got to me and turns out that a family friend was visiting who has a massive boar bowl, very large dog. Dog was a gentle giant, thankfully, because I was frozen to the spot. In an undetermined year, my stepdad resided in Virginia when he was approximately eight years old, right on the edge of the great dismal swamp. According to his account, one night, when the sky was either cloudless or exceptionally bright, he hadn't considered the moon's presence until recently, he encountered a peculiar sight. Looking out of his window, he saw a creature that was staring directly at him. He described it as having spittle running down its face, with eyes locked onto his. This creature was purportedly standing on its hind legs, covered in matted fur of cream, red, and brown hues, its facial features were notably human-like, except for its snout. It had high jawbones, a structure around its eyes and eyes themselves that bore a striking resemblance to a human. He believed the creature's eye color to be yellow. What makes this account intriguing and potentially credible is the vast expanse of the great dismal swamp, a region that has remained largely untouched by humans. In recent years, researchers have begun studying the swamp's inhabitants. The swamp's environment is characterized by wet, mossy grounds that effectively absorb sound. People have been known to wander into it and vanish without a trace. 
The mystery of what might be concealed in this uncharted territory sends a chill down my spine. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that that night he crawled out of his bed and sought refuge in his mother's room. In the morning, when they inspected the house, they discovered that the ground under all the windows had been disturbed, and the grass showed signs of being trampled. There were even visible scratches on the wood beneath his window, and paint was missing. Strangely, there were no discernible footprints to explain these unusual occurrences. I was lying across my bed, wide awake, when I heard a low, deep growl from just outside my window. I called out to my mom, Jen, who was in the living room. She informed me via VoIP app that she had heard the growl as well. While we were talking, I heard a second growl from outside my room, and it was loud enough for me to hear it even in the living room where my mom was speaking. We decided to move to the same room, the living room, for the rest of the night to ensure our safety. I took a trip up to my sister's place on Roan Mountain in 1989 with my wife. After the first few days of running around and seeing the sights, we spent the day just hanging out at the house. This led to a few cold beverages being consumed and the grill getting fired up that evening. Later that night, around 9 p.m., I went out on the back porch to get another beer. That's when I noticed about half a dozen deer about 100 yards out in the field behind the house. One had a nice rack, and I couldn't quite make out the number of points. So I slipped off the porch and eased over to the corner of the fence, which put me about 60 to 70 yards away from them. As I stood there against the fence watching the deer, that's when I noticed the moon. When I say I noticed it, I mean, I noticed that it was huge and seemed much closer than I'd ever seen it before. I stood there at this fence, watching the deer, or was supposed to be, but I couldn't take my eyes off this big, glowing, yellowish-orange ball of light that seemed to be just out of reach. So after what I thought was about twenty minutes later, I found out it was more than an hour, I started noticing a tickling sensation on the back of my neck. I shrugged my shoulders and turned my neck a couple of times to shake loose whatever was tickling me, and just then the deer got spooked and bounced away. The noise finally forced me to break my gaze on the moon. That's when I realized that I'd probably been out there long enough. I decided to go back inside. I took one last look and mumbled a wow at the beauty of this little sun, reflecting satellite that orbits our world, and that's when it hit me. I felt the hot breath of a huge creature hit the back of my neck at the same time hearing or feeling the deepest chest rumbling I'd ever heard. I spied on to my right, looking over my shoulder. All I could see was black as far as my peripheral vision would allow. It was a Bigfoot. This all happened in a split second. When I got my head around far enough, I realized that my face was maybe eight to ten inches away from this thing's upper abdomen. Looking up, I saw this beast's pectoral muscles stick off its chest about six inches, and they were huge. Its chest was every bit four and a half feet wide. Its shoulders were as big as basketballs, adding another foot or so on each side from shoulder to shoulder. This thing was at least six feet wide. I didn't get a good look at its hands or face, but its arms were probably more impressive than its chest and shoulders. Its arms were covered in long, dark hair, maybe four or six inches in length. If I had to guess, this behemoth must have been around ten feet tall and seven to eight hundred pounds. As far as its face went from the angle I was at, all I could make out was a squared, off-bearded chin. I couldn't see a nose, eyes, ears, a raised brow ridge, a conical head, nothing. So I couldn't say whether it looked more like a man or an ape. Its arms were more like an ape's, but its chest was more human, like just a little hairier than most. Now this is where the story starts getting weird. As I mentioned earlier, it all happened in a split second. As I spun around and was in the process of looking up, the creature was going from a bent over position to standing up straight and taking a step back to my right. 
as it pulled its left leg over its right. It was like it was slipping through a slit in a green screen. I'm not sure if it was a portal or some sort of interdimensional doorway. All I knew is this huge thing vanished within that split second. There was no foul smell associated with this creature. There was a slight musty smell, but it reminded me of the same smell a horse gives off. This is not my personal story. It happened to my husband's friend, though I got a good chill up my spine the first time that I heard it. I haven't met the couple, but my husband is Mr. Pragmatic, and he wouldn't tell the story if it wasn't true. When my husband's friend and his wife decided that they wanted a family, they moved to a house in the middle of nowhere. We're talking the total boondocks. The closest neighbors were over a mile down the road. Forests surrounded them, and to these folks this was a dream come true. They moved in, nested, and soon their first child was born. There was one nerve-wracking part of their lives, though. The husband occasionally worked a night shift. I want to say that he was a cop, but I may be getting that part wrong. While the wife enjoyed living in the country, the nights alone were a little intimidating. Her anxiety was enhanced by the birth of their kid. She didn't feel that she could adequately defend the baby by herself. The husband tried to ease her mind and bought a gun to keep in a safe in the bedroom. She learned how to use it, which brought her some sense of comfort. One night when her husband was working, the wife heard a loud rattling sound. Afraid, she grabbed the gun from the safe. She quietly made her way through a hallway and was able to see her son sleeping safely in his bed as the rattling continued at what she then discerned as the back door. As she neared the back door, she saw a man wrestling with a lock on the door under the glow of an outside security light. Here's where the story became especially creepy, at least in my opinion. Though she was cloaked in relative darkness, there must have been enough light shining through the glass door for the man to notice her. He suddenly stopped what he was doing and held eye contact with her. They stood there staring at each other. Then, without breaking eye contact, the man's face transformed into a snarl and he started trying to break the glass on the door. The wife raised the gun and shot. Glass flew everywhere. The man fell and went into death grips. She was there alone with his body until the sheriff's department arrived. When the husband got to the house, the crime scene was still intact. He said that he had never wanted to kick something so much as that intruder's corpse. I traveled about an hour from my home in Lynchburg, Virginia, to do some exploring in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm not big on hiking or whatever, but I had recently gone through a breakup with my boyfriend. I just needed some fresh air and some time alone. I parked and just started wandering. I didn't follow a specific path. I was mesmerized by the gigantic trees, the fauna, and the wildlife. I was really enjoying myself. I'd been hiking for about two hours when I saw this large hole on a nearby mountainside. It wasn't too far, seemed like it was a manageable climb. So I climbed up, and when I got to the grotto, I stuck my head in, and it was dark. I turned on my phone's flashlight, and that's when I realized this was a deep cave. I got a little carried away, thinking about how I had discovered a cave, wondering if anybody else had ever been up here. It was sort of exciting. I ducked down, and I walked in. I went in a few feet I was very careful, but I could see a smooth rock floor beneath me. I felt safe, so I continued walking forward, following the light from my flashlight. I was maybe 15 or 20 feet in when I realized I was in a cavern. There were a few openings in the walls surrounding the cavern. I picked the closest one to me and I looked in. It was another tunnel. It was big enough to walk through, so I stepped through the opening and I carefully walked a few more feet. That's when I heard scampering. I stopped walking, thinking maybe I had kicked something. I looked all around but saw nothing. I then heard the scampering again. And when I raised my phone up to look ahead of me, I saw a person, only like not a regular person, but a humanoid. It was fully nude, and it looked very malnourished. It was crouched down on its hands and feet about four feet in front of me. 
It was so pale, like maybe it had never, ever even seen the sun. Its face was sunken in, and I could clearly see the cheekbones. It had totally black eyes. Not just the pupils, but all black. Between its hands was a half-eaten rabbit. I heard the chattering sound, and I realized that this humanoid was making the noise. I don't know how I knew, but it was calling out to others. I moved back toward the entrance, but I kept my flashlight on it. It seemed fearful of the light and didn't try to move towards me. I was able to get back through the entrance, and I took a look around. I didn't see anything else. I then ran for my life back the way I came, and I could hear the chattering, and it was getting closer and louder. There had to be more than just one. I felt like I was being hunted. I was able to see the light from the original opening. I tripped I quickly got up and rushed out of that hole. I ran and slid down the mountain. I only stopped when I was sure nothing had followed me. Then I realized I had no phone. I must have lost it when I tripped. I had no idea where I was, but I was just happy to be alive. I did eventually find the trail and I managed to make it back to my car. I found the local police station, but it was pointless because they wouldn't take me seriously. So I just drove home. I cried so much on that drive, and when I got home, I checked my phone's location with the satellite feature. All I could see was a heavily wooded area. The last time I checked the location of my phone, it had moved several miles away from its original location. I'm sure the battery has long since run out. I have done a bit of research online and found references to crawler humanoids, but I'm just wondering if this was a feral human of some kind. Regardless, I'm not going back to that area. A buddy and I went hunting when we were young, 12, 13. We had bub guns and pocket knives and thought we were cool. As we chilled quietly, trying not to scare anything away, probably 40 yards behind my friend in the direction that led to the thick of the woods, I saw a very tall, completely covered in fur, an upright figure running freakishly fast, away from us, into the woods. I screamed and ran as fast as I could home, which was about a mile at the time. I still don't know what it was, and thinking about it gives me chills. My experiences took place in the early 80s in Toronto, Canada, and just like the fellow writing of his experiences on your site, mine also took place in a very old house. The house then was at least 75 years old and has since been razed to the ground and a brand new structure was built in its place. When my family moved in there, we experienced the same sort of events, arguments, abusive situations, and strange phenomena but not to the point where we all noticed it right away. In fact, my younger brother was a skeptic up to the point where things began happening to him as well. I think he took this attitude to allay the fears he must have had. Our father moved out of the house after the first year and away to another part of the country, so just the three of us were left. At one point, we had family come and live with us before they too departed. My experiences began with an event I will never forget when I was 16. It was summer and I had difficulty sleeping. This went on for one month approximately. Then one night I had fallen into a light sleep when I was violently awakened. I recall hearing a sound that I thought was an explosion and thinking that our stove must have exploded in the kitchen below me. I opened my eyes and looked around the room in the darkness, but saw nothing to indicate anything was happening. Suddenly, my bed began to shake violently up and down, and it felt as though I was being electrocuted through my solar plexus. I couldn't move, but I could see my feet moving as the bed was jumping up and down. Some objects rolled up off my dresser and shot towards the bed. I thought they would hit me as they approached with such speed. In fact, they stopped suddenly and began to swirl around in a counterclockwise direction above me. And from the center of this swirl, a bright white light appeared, and some voices which were like high-pitched shrieks, or nails on a blackboard, said quite clearly, The message we bring is to tell the people he is still alive. And then everything stopped suddenly. I was terrified and basically thought I would end up in a nut house. 
I remember shaking from fear so much I could barely get out of bed. I made my way to my mom's room to tell her about it, at which point she assured me I was having nightmares. Say your prayers and go back to sleep, she said. I returned to my room after an hour or more, but I couldn't sleep. It was a long time before I could sleep there. In fact, the next event happened the following January. I was coming home very late one night and decided to take the shortcut through the alleyway by our street. I passed a parked van with windows all around, and I saw a movement in the van, which made me feel somehow by its shape, size, and response that it was a Doberman someone had left outside in their van. I kept walking, but the thought pestered me that someone should leave their dog out in midwinter in the night. So I went back to the van cautiously peering in, but there was nothing at all, not even a cushion or anything hanging from the ceiling. Okay, I thought I guess I imagined it. I happily kept walking home, and when I was in the alley, I suddenly heard footsteps behind me in the snow. I got a little freaked out, and when I turned my head, I didn't see anyone there. As I got to the end of the alleyway and turned onto my street, I looked back to the entrance to see if anyone was following me. What I saw shocked and terrified me. There was a street light right at the corner, and in the pool of its light was standing this enormous creature. It was at least eight feet tall and huge. What struck me was that its form was completely black. There were no reflective surfaces on it whatsoever. In fact, the light was shining directly on it, and it seemed to absorb that light. It had large things on its head, which I took to be horns or ears, and its fingers ended in points like claws and the feet as well. Its eyes were red, completely and staring right at me. I don't think my feet touched the ground. I ran so fast. After that experience, I had a few others with the same creature. Another night I came home late again, and I fell onto my bed after shutting the door, just wanting to fall asleep. My cat was in the bed with me when we both heard a voice laughing in the room, a masculine voice. My cat freaked out and ran to the door, scratching and meowing loudly to get out. I opened the door, and she took off. I just didn't want to believe anything was in there with me, so I pointedly turned my back to the rest of the room and went to sleep. Another night I turned over and opened my eyes early in the morning, and there was the same creature, smaller though, standing in front of my closet staring at me. I recall I got really mad and told it to F off and turned around and went back to sleep. Meanwhile, my brother had seen the exact same creature, but he had yellow eyes. He confided the story to me years later when we had left the house and had no knowledge of my experiences. He told me he had awakened early one morning and found that he had left the light on in his room. Thinking that he should get up and turn it off, he turned onto his back and opened his eyes, and there sitting on his bed's headboard was the same creature. Talons on feet and hands, completely black with no reflective surfaces. But his was, he said, about four feet tall and squatting on the headboard, staring at him with yellow eyes. He said he was terrified and decided not to turn off the light after all. I don't remember if he said it vanished quickly or if he shut his eyes and when he opened them it was gone. He said he never saw it again but had other strange experiences in that house. One day we decided that we should trade rooms. So I moved all my stuff out to his room and vice versa. I teased him and said he'd have to share my room with a visitor, but he was disbelieving. After I had moved to his room, I had my last experience in that house that was in the shadow people realm. I woke up one night to a sound in my room, like rustling. I was wide awake because I thought it might be a mouse. I switched on my lamp and looked toward the other end of the room, but seeing and hearing nothing, I lay down again with the light still on. I turned to look at the clock and saw that it was 2.20 a.m., then I saw these two large globes of light beyond my nightstand. I was frozen up on one elbow because I had been about to turn out my light again. They moved in a way that reminded me of balloons falling. The larger of the two was golden yellow in color, and the smaller was blue. They looked like spheres lit from within and 
emanating a misty light from their forms. I somehow could sense that they were intelligent. They knew that I was looking at them, and they wanted me to see. The larger golden one floated almost majestically to the door, whereupon it flattened to a pancake shape in under half a second and slipped under the door. The second smaller one followed along and did the same. I was very nervous and scared at that point, but only because I had to go to the bathroom, and this meant I had to go out into the hallway where they had vanished to. Our hallway was very dark and without a proper light, as the house was old and not renovated very well. I waited for as long as I could, which was about fifteen minutes, and then I cautiously opened my door and went. The hallway was pitch black, so my plan was to inch my way to the bathroom with my back to the wall, so nothing could sneak up on me, and once I got there, I could turn on the bathroom light to illuminate the hallway. I followed my plan through, and as it turned out, when I turned on the bathroom light, it shone down on under the stairs in the first landing. In the light were two shadow people. I've only ever thought of them that way because there was no other way to describe them. They looked like shadows, only they were in the light. They didn't look like the other creatures I had seen. In fact, they looked like people in the sense that they had a head and arms and legs and torso and hands. They threw up their hands as though in surprise, like I'd caught them unexpectedly, and then they flew down the stairs without a sound. It took me a long time to come out of that bathroom, as I didn't want to encounter any of these things again. Unlike your other poster, these creatures never touched me, at least to my knowledge, and never tried to hurt me, although they did scare the dickens out of me. I recall telling these stories to people years later in other parts of the world, hearing similar tales and wondering just what they could be. Somehow we don't seem that much closer to knowing. I would conjecture, though, that as is the case with plant and insect life here, we certainly haven't got all the facts in yet. Perhaps these creatures share the world we live in, but differently, and we have learned to ignore them or pretend they don't exist. Maybe they are trying to tell us they do exist. Perhaps like us, there are those with good intentions and those with not so good intentions. It's my opinion that we are getting closer to the truth every day. A side note here, I read a book a year ago called Initiation by Elizabeth Heitch in which she distinctly mentions the shadow people and the effects they caused on the lives of people she knew, including her own son, before World War II. If this is true, then perhaps these are beings who've been with us for a very long time. Then again, if they are time travelers, all things are possible. I'm a park ranger out in Nevada. There was an old abandoned mining town that sat a ways off the main road. The park service had claimed it a while back, but people were not encouraged to visit there. In fact, it was plainly marked with signs that said, Off limits, no trespassing, danger. Hell, about the only thing they didn't do was build a moat around the place. Sometimes I wonder if they should. Some people need to learn to read or listen one of the two, because it seemed like I was always chasing people out of there. They'd look at me like I was crazy, but every one of them would spray gravel as they hauled ass after I'd tell them the story. I'm not supposed to tell the story. I've been warned many times, even threatened with much worse than the unemployment line. I guess maybe I need to learn how to listen, too. But it was the best way to make sure people left and never came back. I'm tired of being told to keep my mouth shut. I'm tired that nothing's been done about it. We rangers are supposed to just go about our jobs and pretend it never happened. Well, I believe that's the best and quickest way for it to happen again. And I never want it to happen again. It was a while ago. That's my way of saying I forget how long ago it was, but the memory's still fresh enough to tell. It was back when even I was unsure why the town was off limits. I'd heard old wives' tales and urban legends, but no one would ever commit to anything concrete. I asked around once and was told that I was better off not knowing. The old rangers would just tell me to mind my business and stay out of town, but something about it always intrigued me. 
I was never good at blindly following orders, so as often as I could, I'd find some excuse to drive past it. On that day, it was a good thing I did, or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. I noticed a small mobile home parked at the edge of the town. I knew it hadn't been there the day before. I pulled up behind it and got out of my truck. I scanned the area around and didn't see anything moving that the wind wasn't blowing. I walked around the vehicle and it seemed to be in good shape. None of the tires were flat. There seemed to be no good reason for them sitting there unless they were sightseeing. I peeked in the windshield but couldn't see anyone, so I went to the side door and knocked. Park Ranger, I said, anybody in there? The wind whistling was my only answer. I knocked again. Park Ranger, is everyone all right? No answer. I pulled on the door latch and it opened. I'm coming in, I said. Just need to check to make sure everyone's okay. I pulled the door open and stepped inside. Unconsciously, I rested my hand on my sidearm. I closed the door behind me, leaving the wind outside. I looked around the camper and found plenty of food and supplies. They seemed to be well stocked for a trip. I stepped back toward the bedroom, keeping an ear open for anything. It was eerily silent. The only thing I could hear was the sound of my boots on the linoleum as I headed back the short hallway. It wasn't a long walk until I got there. The bedroom was clean and the bed had been made. I opened a few drawers and found clothes for a man and a woman. There was no sign of a struggle, so I went back out to the kitchen, stopping to open the bathroom door and find two kids' toothbrushes and toothpaste sitting on the sink. Just like the bedroom, everything seemed to be in its place. I noticed the hand towel holder was empty. I looked on the floor to see if it had fallen, but the towel was just gone. I shrugged it off and went back out to the kitchen. The table was still folded down into a bed, as these smaller models were known for. Scanning around, I was hard-pressed to find anything out of the ordinary, except for the fact that no one was there. I stepped outside, and the sun had disappeared. It would be dark soon. I looked around, but didn't see anyone. It was as if they parked the camper at the edge of town and went for a walk. I stepped out of the camper and turned to close the door. That was when I saw it. There was a small dot of red on the step. I leaned closer and it looked like it could be dried blood. I tried to dismiss it as nothing. People drip blood every day for simple, non-threatening reasons. Nosebleeds, small cuts, general accidents. It could be absolutely nothing. But when you add in a missing family at the edge of an abandoned town that's supposed to be off, limits, normal things don't look so normal. I didn't touch it in case it needed to be tested later for a DNA sample. And there it was. I was already starting to look at this as a crime scene. I looked down at the ground and saw my boot prints in the dirt, leading up to the camper. I also saw other tracks. There was another set of adult boot prints, a set of adult sneakers, and two different sets of smaller sneakers. Those were spooky but comforting. At least I knew these people were here somewhere. They hadn't just vanished from inside the camper. No, it was the other footprints that gave me chills. They were adult-sized, and it looked like there was more than one of them. But the creepy thing about them was they were bare feet. I couldn't imagine anyone who lived in the area being stupid enough to walk around the desert in their bare feet. Aside from the different types of scorpions, there were also snakes, spiders, and lizards, just to name a few. It was becoming more likely that I would find this family dead from stupidity. I followed the barefoot tracks, and they seemed to lead around the corner of the camper. In fact, they did several laps around the camper, with frequent stops where the feet were pointed toward the camper as if looking inside. That's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. This family had been stalked. I stepped in a wider circle so I wouldn't disturb the footprints. It became more apparent by the minute that this was a crime scene. I pulled out my radio to call in my position and request backup or police. But my radio was strangely silent. It didn't even click when I released the talk button. The light was lit, so I knew the battery was charged. It just wasn't transmitting. The smart thing to do just then would have been to get in my truck and drive to the station to report what was happening. I took one step toward the truck 
That's when I heard the scream. It was a woman's scream, high and piercing. It was a scream of pain and anguish, as if her whole world had come crashing down. My fight or flight kicked in, and there wasn't an ounce of flight in it. In a heartbeat, my gun was in my hand. I turned toward the town and began following the footprints. Once they were done circling the camper, they headed straight into town. Dusk had faded and taken the light with it. I pulled my flashlight off my belt and used it to guide me on my trail. There were a half dozen buildings, all in some level of decay. I was worried about stepping into one and it just collapsing on top of me that aside from the chance of meeting a scorpion or some other creature that didn't appreciate being disturbed in their territory. The wind had died down and the air was still. It was so quiet. I could hear my own footsteps. There was something else, too. I felt a vibration in the air. At the time, I thought it was just my heightened senses at the prospect of meeting up with a dangerous person who may have harmed that family. Even though everything within me was demanding I run towards the scream I'd heard, my steps were slow and measured. I needed more input. I needed to know how many people I was dealing with. I needed to identify threats and if I would be able to deal with this without becoming a victim myself. As I approached the first building, I had a strong feeling of being watched. Stepping on the porch made the boards creak threateningly. I didn't want this to end with a broken ankle or worse. I tested the boards before putting full weight on them and slowly approached the broken windows. I shone my light inside. I panned around slowly, finding a bunch of old boxes and general junk with the odd wooden chair and table. I was about to move on when back in the far corner I saw a pair of eyes lit by my flashlight. I froze, my light locked on it. The eyes seemed to be locked on the light as well. I couldn't tell what it was, but it scared the hell out of me. I suddenly thought of the movie I'd recently seen, Jurassic Park. When the actor was explaining how raptors attack, how one will draw your attention while two more sneak up on you and attack from the side, I suddenly felt very vulnerable, as if someone was sneaking up behind me. I whipped around, pointing with my gun and flashlight, my eyes darting all around, but I couldn't see anything. I shone my light back inside, but the eyes were gone. This didn't comfort me. In fact, it did the opposite. I was in a panic. I felt like I was surrounded, and they were just toying with me. I didn't even know who they were. I took a few deep breaths to get myself under control. I knew panic led to bad decisions, and I couldn't afford any bad decisions out here on my own. I shone my light back toward the camper and saw a shadow dart out of the light. I knew it was all or nothing. There was no backing out. I was being hunted just like that family had been. I didn't know what was hunting me, but it didn't matter. Whoever or whatever, it was dangerous. Focus, I told myself. Stay on your toes. Remember your training. Even though my training also said, don't get yourself in a bad situation. It was already too late for that. Something was near the camper. I still had no idea if this family was dead or alive. The only things I had to go on were mysterious footprints and a scream. It was the stuff of every horror movie ever made. I just hoped I didn't end up as one of the victims that died a horrible, gory death to save some stupid teenagers who risked their own lives by blundering into something they should left alone. I sighed, turned my light back to the ground, and followed the footprints. I noticed for the first time there were other marks among the footprints. They had been walked over and obscured, but it looked like two long lines like someone was being dragged. I brought my flashlight back up just in time to see a set of eyes disappear behind a building on the other side of the street. I stepped up to the next building and shone my light inside to find much the same as the first, minus the eyes. I didn't linger long before turning my light back out to the streets and the other buildings. I felt like it somehow kept them at bay, as if they would work their way closer to me if I didn't sign my light their way. I didn't know how long this would last. I continued to the next building with a larger building looming larger at the end of the street. It looked like it was an old church. There was the rough shape of a steeple that had partially collapsed. 
I turned and flashed my light back to the street to keep the hunters back. When I stepped up to the window of the next building and shone my light inside, I found bones. Piles of bones. Most looked like they were from smaller animals, but there were larger ones interspersed with them. I was sure I spotted a couple of human femurs. I tried my radio again, but it still wasn't working. The vibration in the air was getting stronger. It was oppressive like the pressure you feel when you're underwater. The stillness in the air magnified any sound. I could hear the footsteps of someone behind me, but when I turned, I couldn't see anyone. I left the bone storage building and headed for the last building at the end of the street, the church. I walked up to the doors, and they were very plain. Two wooden doors, no Gothic architecture. No cross, just a couple of wooden doors. They looked like they were about to fall off their hinges. I hesitated, turned, and looked back down the street. I knew they were there, but couldn't see them. This was where they'd been hurting me all along. I held my gun and flashlight at the ready, knowing I was in for a fight as soon as the doors opened. I took a deep cleansing breath, then shoved the doors open. I shone my light all around, my eyes darting to all the dark corners. Except they weren't dark. There were candles lit all around. It was quite beautiful. It was also quite empty. There was no one there. Even empty and well lit, it gave off a creepy vibe. Why do empty churches always do that? You would think it would be the opposite. My senses went on high alert. I didn't trust it. It must be a trap, as I continued to scan back and forth, looking for any hiding spots among the pews. I noticed there was one person there. In the first pew, bent over so I could barely see them. I slowly made my way forward, head on a swivel as I approached the lone figure. When I was nearly there, it looked like they were barely breathing. I came around in front of the creature and aimed my gun. She looked up at me. She was naked, and her hands and mouth were bound. As soon as she saw me, she started screaming into the gag in her mouth. She was screaming so hard, her face turned red. I reached down and slid the gag off her mouth. It's a trap, she screamed. I looked up and saw my worst nightmare. There were creatures, dozens of them. Each one looked vaguely human, but they were deformed. There was one that had one healthy arm and a second that was shriveled up. One had only a single leg, but still managed to hop toward me. Another had no legs, but used its arms to crawl on the floor. None of them had a full set of teeth, but they all had a look of hunger and rage in their eyes. They came from everywhere. Some even crawled their way down from hiding places in the ceiling. Like some horrific Spider-Man, they swarmed toward the front of the church. I looked around for anywhere to go, anywhere to hide, when I locked eyes on a door that looked like it was a closet. Come on, I said, grabbing her arm and dragging her over to the door. No, I can't. Please don't make me, she said, tugging against me. We go in here or we die, I said, cutting the ropes around her wrist and putting my jacket over her shoulder. She reluctantly came along with me as the horde of creatures was nearly on us. Quick, I said, opening the door and shoving her through. I slammed it shut behind me, taking out my knife and jamming it into the wooden door frame to keep it shut. I turned and nearly ran her over. She hadn't moved. She was standing there staring into the dark. I shone my flashlight in front of us and saw a rickety staircase descending into the darkness. Please don't make me go down there, she whimpered. We don't have a choice, I said. They'll be through this door soon. The pounding had gotten louder. She turned toward the door then pulled my jacket closer around her and took a deep breath. I stepped around her and led the way, shining my light all around, trying to make sure we wouldn't run into any surprises. The boards creaked menacingly with every step I took. I couldn't see what was underneath, but had no desire to find out the fast way. I looked back, and she was still staring down. I held my hand out, and she slowly took one step, then another. Her bare feet were filthy. I wondered if she was getting splinters as she took each step slowly and gingerly as if walking on hot coals. After she had taken a few steps, I turned back to guide our way. The stairway was long and attached to an uneven stone wall. At some points it jutted out far enough I had to squeeze around to get to the next step. 
It was getting colder as we descended. I started missing my jacket, but knew she needed it more. The spider webs weren't helping my anxiety either. I wondered if they were made by the deadly breed. I glanced back and saw she was still working her way down the stairs. When I looked forward again, there was a creature coming up the stairs toward me. I didn't think, just reacted. I barely had the gun pointed until I fired. The creature fell back with shock frozen on its face and tumbled down the stairs. I instantly regretted my action as my ears were already ringing from the gunshot in such an enclosed place. I turned around to check on her, but she was curled up in a fetal position sitting on a step, ears covered, rocking back and forth. It's okay, I tried to say, but my voice sounded strange. I guess temporary deafness will do that. At least I hoped it was temporary. She didn't look at me. I was unsure if she had heard me, so I touched her shoulder, and she immediately recoiled and climbed several stairs, backing away. I bent down to her. Look, I know you're scared. I would be, too. But if we're going to get out of this, we have to do it together. If I'm going to have to check on you every few steps, we'll be helpless if another one of those things attacks. I D don't want to go down there, she stammered. I looked ahead and then back at her. We have no choice. I turned and started down the stairs again. After around a dozen steps, I turned to see she had stood and was slowly making her way down again. I kept going until I made it to the bottom and kicked the corpse of the creature out of our way. I looked around, but there wasn't much to see. It was a passageway made of the same rough-cut rock walls and a dirt floor. I turned to see her make it to the last step. Her eyes were wide with fear. I could only imagine what she had already been through. She looked away as she stepped past the corpse. I decided to make a little conversation as we walked down the endless passageway to get her to focus on something other than our situation. You're from the camper, aren't you? I said. She nodded absently as she stared at the floor. Were you going on vacation? Another nod. I saw the kids' toothbrushes on the bathroom sink. How many kids do you have? Her eyes glazed over. Two boys, and your husband is with you? She nodded. Where were you headed, Vegas? What made you stop here? The kids wanted to see the abandoned town. Tears streamed down her dirty cheeks, making lines on her face. Would you like me to stop talking? She nodded. We continued forward in silence. The chill of the place made me shiver, but not just because of the temperature. The thought of being attacked at any moment was more than keeping me on my toes. It was wearing on my nerves. After some distance, we came to an opening that stretched out into a full room. She stopped and stared. I was puzzled at first until I noticed the smell. It was the stench of death. I shone my light around the room. The first corner I came to held a pile of bones. There was no denying these ones were human. They were large in the right shape. There were even a couple of full torsos still together that hadn't deteriorated yet. In the next corner, there were three bodies hanging from the dirt ceiling. It looked like a man and two boys. They had been strung up by their arms and were covered in blood. There were innumerable cuts and puncture wounds. But the most horrid sight were the many bites that were taken out of them. She collapsed and began to sob. I knew right away this was her family. I'm so sorry, I said. She looked at me with a mix of hopelessness and rage. I tried to tell you not to come down here, she said with quiet forcefulness. I'm sure we can find some way to. She shook her head violently. You don't understand, she said, looking me straight in the eyes for the first time. This is a trap. She stood up straight for the first time since I'd seen her in the church, took off my jacket, and tossed it behind her. She was beautiful, even though she was covered in filth. My children need food, she said, stretching out her arm. In an instant, two deformed creatures appeared and stood beside her. She stroked the thinning hair on their heads as they cooed at her. So there was no woman in the camper, I said, trying to stall for time until I could come up with a plan. Oh, no, there was a woman. She was taken to the birthing house. She will give my children, their own children, against her will, of course. She looked at me with disdain. 
She is a tool we will use to survive, just like my ancestors were treated as tools to be used in the mines. I glanced around the room and saw several more creatures emerge from the shadows and advance slowly toward me. I knew I was trapped. My mind scrambled for some plan, any plan to escape the horrors that waited for me. I glanced at the three bloody, mangled bodies dangling from the ceiling and knew that would be my fate. I made my decision and didn't hesitate to implement it. In a flash, I drew my pistol and shot her in the forehead. The sound was still echoing when I started to run back to the passageway I had come from. I hoped that the shock of seeing their mother die would give me a head start before the horde of creatures hunted me down and tore me to shreds. Time seemed to move in slow motion. I felt like I was running underwater. Every move, every step seemed incredibly slow. I knew they would catch me. There was no doubt in my mind. It was only a matter of time. The only thing that kept me from giving up was the sheer will to live. I swung the flashlight as I ran, making shadows jump and fly around. I arrived at the bottom of the stairs much sooner than I thought possible and threw myself up them two at a time, praying that I didn't trip. The horde was hot on my heels. I could hear them getting closer. The grunts and snarls spurred me on even faster. I felt something brush against my heel and knew I had to act. I didn't bother to look back. I fired two shots into the closest one. I heard the inhuman scream and the sound of falling bodies. I risked a glance back to see them all tumbling down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief as I reached the door and struggled to pry my knife out of the wood. After a few agonizingly long seconds, it came free and I dove through the door. Much to my surprise and relief, the church was empty. They must have all gone another way to trap me below. I looked over at the dozens of glowing candles and ran straight toward them, knocking over as many as I could. I ran to the far wall and did the same on my way out the door. Once I was through, I turned back and jammed my knife into the doors so they wouldn't open. I didn't waste time celebrating my close escape. I ran down the middle of the street so I would have a good view of anyone or anything chasing me. It didn't take long until I heard footsteps behind. They sounded more like a pack of dogs chasing me. I glanced back and sure enough, there were a half dozen deformed creatures in hot pursuit against the backdrop of the church engulfed in flame. I took some solace in the fact that at least some of the unnatural bastards must have burned up in the blaze. I had a stitch in my side and my leg muscles burned, but I didn't dare slow down. Even at the speed I was running, they were catching up. I wasn't sure if I would make it to the truck before they got me. It was going to be close. I reached the truck and breathed a sigh of relief that I hadn't locked it. By the time I got the keys and the ignition and started it, they were on me. I locked the doors and slammed it into reverse as the first body flew into my windshield, shattering it. I got some momentum going as another landed on my hood and another grabbed my door handle. I swung the truck around and slammed on the brakes, sending them flying. I threw it in drive and stomped on the gas, spraying gravel. I hadn't gone more than a few yards when another freak landed in the truck bed and started pounding on the cab roof. I could see the dents getting deeper. It would be through soon. Suddenly the pounding stopped. I kept my eye on the road, but turned to see what was happening. It smashed through my rear window, grabbing me by the neck. I swerved to try to break its grip to no avail. I could feel myself starting to black out. I knew that would be a death sentence. I pointed my gun out the window, but the creature grabbed it before I could aim at its head. My mind raced faster than the truck that was hurtling down the dirt road at breakneck speeds. I was seeing stars. I knew it was a matter of minutes until the end, if not seconds. I squeezed the trigger. The gun went off right beside its head, missing it by a few inches. I was done. It howled in pain and fear at the sound and the heat of the round going off. Amazingly, it let go of the gun. I aimed at its head and squeezed the trigger again. Blood rained on me as its head snapped back and it fell into the bed of the truck with a heavy thump. I set the gun on the seat beside me as I breathed huge gulps of air, wiping blood out of my eyes. 
My vision returned just in time for the turn. Onto the main road. The tires screeched as they bit into the asphalt on the way to the ranger station. I got there shortly after sunrise, pulled into a parking space, and sat back in the seat. Exhaustion and adrenaline crash sapped my energy. I fell asleep. I woke to the sound of someone knocking on my window. I whipped around, grabbed the gun off the seat, and swung it back around at the window. Ho, oh, there, son, the older ranger said, raising his hands. What's got your panties in a bunch? I took a deep breath, lowered the gun in the window, then told him the whole story. The longer I went, the more serious he became. Until the story was done, his face was made of granite. He stuck his hand in the window. Keys, he said. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and handed them to him. Go inside and get yourself cleaned up, he said. I'll take care of this. I stepped out of the truck on shaky legs and walked into the ranger station, threw away my bloody uniform and took a long shower. By the time I had finished and changed into a fresh uniform, the other ranger was back. He stepped inside the station and scanned the room until he found me. All taken care of, he said with a crooked smile. What do you mean? I said. Did you call the police? He looked around at the handful of rangers that were milling around the room, trying to make it look like they weren't listening to our conversation. Yeah, we're not going to get the police involved in this, he said. What? Why not? He looked at me with an odd determination in his eyes. So yeah, really killed her, did ya? He said. Of course, it was her or me. Most of the folks around here give that place a wide berth, he said. There's signs all over saying no trespassing in danger. You'd think it was almost natural selection for those who ignore all the warnings, but those travelers. And then there are others who visit the place on the down low, all quiet-like, he said, as if I hadn't said anything. Those folks might say you robbed them of their fun. You might even call them conjugal visits. There might even be some of those folks in this very room. I stared at him in disbelief then looked around the room and saw every set of eyes focused on me. There wasn't a smile or even a hint of one that suggested this was a joke. He clapped his hand on my shoulder. Why don't you head home and rest today, he said. You've had a long night. We'll take care of things. He ushered me toward the door, pausing before opening it. Just remember that nothing happened, he said, because if the police get an anonymous phone call... We might have to drive out and grab a couple of children to come visit your house in the middle of the night. Yeah, get me. I nodded my head in a daze as he opened the door. That's the story I tell when people don't take the hint and stay away from the town. It's been years and every once in a while, I hear of travelers that disappeared in the area. I shake my head and wonder... I am so frightened right now, and it's hard to put these words down. I had to take a quick break. My encounter may seem mild compared to others, but it still physically shakes me to my core. On a hot summer night in August of 92, my mom bade two of my brothers, and I decided we would get a Papa John's pizza and head to the Dixie Twin Drive. In movie theater, it was our 21st, our payday family ritual. I have another older brother, but he had already moved out. After finishing our pizza in the movies, we headed out, but Daddy decided to take a drive and detoured to another part of town. We ended up on Shiloh Springs Road in Trotwood, Ohio, a suburb of Dayton. As we cruised along, enjoying our late-night ride, I noticed that there were no cars in front of or behind us. It was all of a sudden eerie and dead silent. As Daddy drove up the road a little more, I was looking out of the rear window and heard him say, What the heck? I turned around to look out of the front windshield and was in horror, astonished and paralyzed. There aren't enough terrible words to describe the level of fear we were going through. He slowed to a complete stop. The headlights on our 79 Buick had caught this tall, gray, stringy-haired creature with pointed ears and some kind of muzzle. It had yellow sort of glowing, piercing eyes that made me feel like an ant. I have never felt so inferior in all my life. 
The creature crossed the two-lane road and disappeared into the woods in three steps, but not before looking through us, like it wanted us to die. I felt pure hatred coming from this beast. He was mad at us for looking at him. I keep saying him, but I honestly didn't see genitals. I guess I just felt that it was male. He could have smashed through our car and destroyed our entire family. I've seen my beloved daddy scared twice in his life, and both times it was because he felt his death was coming. May he rest in peace. This thing had a face, not just an animal face. It was like he was smart. He was walking, and he owned us for those few moments. Finally, my mom said, Ronnie, go, and he sped off. I cried for a few minutes, but after that, something strange happened. It was like all five of us were entranced on some kind of autopilot. We went home, went to bed, and totally blacked out the incident like he put some kind of spell on us. We never even spoke of it again. But after I became a mother and a wife, my husband and I were talking about Bigfoot, and I sat up, and my memory snapped. I said, Brandon, I think I saw Bigfoot, and I told him the story. He quickly corrected me and said, No, you didn't see Bigfoot. You saw a werewolf. I will never go camping or enter a forest or woods of any kind, nor do I allow my children to. That thing has supernatural powers, and it let us know with its eyes that we were nothing and it would kill us in a second. This was 26 years ago, and I still am overcome with emotion and fear. I just wanted to share in hopes that it would make me feel better, like maybe a weight would be lifted. I doubt it will, though. Thank you so much to anyone who takes the time to read my experience. Just thought I would report this as a potential dog man hearing, not a sighting. Multiple co-workers of mine in Shelby County, Tennessee Medical Facility have heard a strange creature screaming and making crystal clear sounds behind the facility. It is well lit fenced, but there are woods behind and also a river bottom near. Three separate people have heard the noise, two together, one at an earlier time last summer. This most recent event happened within the last month. When discussing it, the third person confidently says that they had also heard the noise in the pre-dawn house while getting something from their vehicle and couldn't believe it, so they had never mentioned it to anyone. After hearing the details of what the other two heard, the third person confided. All three are medical professionals, have outdoor experience, but cannot identify the creature making the sounds. They describe it as being loud, crystal clear, and even though it was from an obvious distance, the call was loud enough to be heard clearly from within a running car, with a defroster blowing. This occurred at twilight, roughly 6 to 7 a.m., also, since this occurred near shift change, there were several ladies coming into work who obviously heard the noise, too, and rushed inside the building as observed by the two who were leaving. A couple of years ago, me and my friend were walking home from a party through some pretty rough neighborhoods anyways. It was quite a long walk home and the clock was like two at night, so nobody was out. Suddenly, a pretty old truck turned on the fog light on his truck and literally blinded us. While we were walking around confused, he hopped out of his truck and said something like, What's up, boys? Talking a little walk all by yourself. Huh? He was probably around 45 years old and really big. We answered with something like, Excuse me, what do you want? And he said, hoppin' fellas, I'll take you home. We politely said no thanks, but he kept on pushing us. At this point, me and my friend started to think the worst, and we both were pretty scared. We took a couple of steps back, and he whispered to me that we should run for the nearby woods. So with this plan in mind, we tried to distract him from us by talking about his car, when we suddenly just ran for it. He didn't run after us or shout to us or anything, but we ran as fast as we could for like three minutes straight before we felt somewhat safe. Both of us were shook and just walked silent back home. 
Now we joke around with it a couple of times, but I, I still remember how scared I was. I was probably around 15 when it happened. Never saw that guy again. Sorry if some of the language was weird. I don't speak English that well. I was on a four-day canoeing trip with friends in a remote part of the southeast United States back when I was a young teen. We were up late, built a bonfire, and goofed off as young boys do. I'm sure we were making a lot of noise. Eventually, the fire died down to just coals, and we just sat around it talking. When we heard a distant high-pitched scream, it freaked us out for a little bit, but eventually we forgot about it and went back to talking. A while later, one of my friends pointed to the opposite bank of the river and said, Guys, what is that? We looked, and standing there in the trees was a huge silhouette of some figure watching us. It was faint but illuminated by the full moon, and it was huge. We just kind of stared at it in shock for a moment before backing away. We went to get our friend's dad and some flashlights. He was intent on showing us that nothing was there. We got back to the spot, and it was still there. So we shined our flashlights on it, but it wasn't enough to get a better look. The thing shone red with the reflection of our flashlights. We watched it watching us for a bit, and it walked up along an embankment, and then walked back and disappeared into the woods. That was more than a decade ago, and we rarely talked about it. We were all pretty freaked out. Didn't see anything but heard. I lived in rural Massachusetts. To anyone who's familiar, that means miles of woodland with spaced out suburban areas in between. I was walking down my grandfather's logging trail, getting ready for his funeral. I'm also an avid mushroom collector, so I'm always walking slowly and staring at the ground. Friends hate me, basically. So I get to this cool little white captain mushroom and stop to take a close-up picture of it. And that's when I heard it. The best way I can describe it is as if somebody with a lot of flesh on his knuckles were punching a tree. Now I know what a deer sounds like when they stomp to protect their children and are smashing their antlers on trees. I've heard bear, fish, or cat, moose, pretty much any animal in western Massachusetts that exists. So naturally I looked up and freaked the hell out. It was so rhythmic. Thud, 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 and it went on for minutes at the same pace. So being the curious person that I am, I let out a whistle that couldn't be mistaken for a bird. Right after my whistle, I hear a low, quick whistle back. My first thought is, oh, it must be some logger, scooping the land past the no trespassing gate, ignorant I know. So I yell out, hello, pretty much as loudly as I could. Then whatever it was ran away faster than I've ever heard a human being run. Using my experience with deer, dogs, moose, and bear, I just assessed that it could have possibly rationalized it being a four-legged creature. I know what they sound like running, and this was much closer to a two-legged creature. I'm 100% positive on that. What doesn't make sense, however, is that the two-legged creature that ran away from me faster than any two-legged creature I have ever heard before also sounded like it was at a minimum 250 pounds. The steps were loud and very frantic. A lot of people believe Bigfoot has a spiritual connection to the forest it remains in, and thus the creatures in it as well. I do not find it a coincidence that this happened the day of my grandfather's funeral. I ran all the way home, and I have never looked back. Okay, so I have this story that happened to me and my friends. To set the scene, we were on a Boy Scout camping shooting trip. There were 20 to 30 of us. We were in a little cabin thing with windows on the front and back and back in the front and back door. There were wooden tables all around the area. The adult cabin was about an eighth of a mile down a gravel road. In the dark, there was obviously a buddy system because it's Boy Scouts. So it's around midnight and everyone had been telling scary stories, just like a normal camping trip. Well, I had to go to the bathroom and ask my friend to come along. 
He said, sure, and he got our knives. We knew that there were bears in the woods, and it made us feel safer. We went to the bathroom and began our walk back. This is where it got scary. I felt an instinctual fear. I looked to my friend, and he had the same look as me. We began to walk just a little bit faster and unfold our pocket knives. I then turned around and saw it. It looked similar to a cat, but it was roughly six feet tall and was on its hind legs, kind of hunched over. I freaked the hell out and started running. My friend saw it too. When we sprinted back to the cabin, it began making a moaning, howling noise and followed us very closely. We pounded on the door, and the guys let us in. We told them what we saw, and they actually believed us. So we locked the front door and looked at the back door. It had no lock. We pushed a table up against it and had a kid there with his knife for safety. We drew the blinds on all the windows that had them. One of them didn't, and we sat there with all the lights on. Then we saw the eyes outside of the windows without blinds. We were all ourselves, and the thing slowly walked to the back door. We heard it bumping up against it, maybe trying to open it. We thought it then left, but we still thought we were going to die. No one slept that night, and when the adults came to wake us up, we told them. They just laughed and said we were making it up. We know it happened, even if they didn't believe us. Not me. Laugh at me. I really don't care. I don't know what I saw, but it looked like a cross between a guy and a wolf. If you don't believe me, I was on my way home from work. I was maybe ten minutes away from the house, coming up a big hill. I suddenly got the strangest feeling, so I slowed down, thinking a deer was going to come out of the woods or something. I just felt like I was being watched or followed. There were no cars in front of me or behind me. I got to the top of the hill and slammed on my brakes, because as soon as I got to the top of the hill, this huge black hairy thing came bounding across the road. It was so big that when it ran, its back arched up kind of like a cheetah, but only a lot more than that. I knew that if it would have stood up, it would have been well over six feet tall, maybe even taller. I also knew another car is so T because when I hit the brakes, another car turned onto that road and slammed onto their brakes. We both just sat there for a few minutes, which was not really safe, considering it, I know. But we were in shock. I truly have no idea what it was that I saw. It was not a dog or a horse. Dogs do not get that big or arch their backs like this thing did when it was running. The arms and legs, whatever it had, were so long it was having to throw them out to the side. Think kind of like a crab walk, just a run. And the appendages it had were just as big as it was. It ran from one side of the woods to the other, non-stop, like it was either going after something or running away from something. I honestly have no idea what the holy freaking hell it was that I saw, and I don't care if you laugh at me. I know what I saw. A few years ago, a parent at the school in which I, Charlie, teach informed me about her co-worker who had a possible Bigfoot sighting. Being a Bigfoot skeptic, she was reluctant to tell me. However, in this case, she felt compelled to tell me about her co-worker's encounter because she explained to me that he is a highly intelligent, no-nonsense, straightforward man who would never make up such a story. After a year of missed communication, trying to obtain his name and number, I gave up. Fortunately, last week when I spoke to this parent over the phone regarding her son's grades, she mentioned to me that she found his phone number. I immediately called him that evening to set up an interview. We met Dave at his home on October 9, 2013 at 4.30 p.m. Dave has worked as a registered nurse for seven years and a chiropractor for 23 years, which will prove very significant in this unique Bigfoot sighting. Dave saw the creature twice within a two-week period. During the first encounter, he was driving home at 11.30 p.m. As Dave approached his house, only a few houses down on his street, he observed a large animal on all fours run across the road directly in front of his car. 
It had dark brown, rusty-colored matted hair, a short snout, small pointed ears on the side of its head, and it was much larger than a large dog. The height of its back was as high as a standard kitchen table. The front shoulders were considerably wider than the hips, and it galloped when it ran, bringing the front two legs or arms up together at the same time. Then the rear two legs. It crossed the road very quickly. Needless to say, he thought this creature was very odd, especially when he saw it again a few weeks later, walking on two legs. Dave's second encounter occurred at 6, 30 a.m., just after sunrise. He was inside his home when he looked out his window and noticed a hairy bipedal figure, estimated at 6 foot 3, with a very unusual gait walking down his street. He had a clear, close view of the creature as it walked parallel to his home, only about 30 feet from his windows, although the sunrise was on the direct opposite side of the creature. After watching it from his windows, Dave ran outside to continue viewing this peculiar creature. When he doesn't immediately see it, he walked to the street and eventually saw it about 100 feet from his location, walking away from him on all fours. It turned and looked back at Dave, and that's when he realized this was the same creature he witnessed a few weeks earlier that darted in front of his car. It did not have a bulky, muscular build, but instead more of a normal, uniform build for its height. Based on Dave's years of experience in the medical field, he estimated its weight at about 200 pounds. The arms were slightly longer than a human's, and the head was proportionate to its body. The hair was short, maybe only an inch, matted and uniform in length or color throughout. Interesting. Notes. When it was walking upright, it leaned forward. It did not walk heel to toe. More on the ball of its feet. The lower legs had a slight backward curve to them. It had a slight bounce to its step. It had a three, four inch snout and small pointed ears on the side of its head. Seasons never change high enough above the snow line, in this land of endless forests and shrouds of drifting mist. I've hunted here on my people's traditional land with my father and with the ghosts of my ancestors. Guided and knowing my path, I call myself a man, but to those whose forest this is, I am animal, friend. It was a day when the dark green shadow of the mountain held a bridal veil of pure white clouds. Old Raven was calling to me, asking for crumbs from my sandwich. That is the last moment of my life when I was at peace. Many seekers of Skookum come here. They think they will find evidence of Bigfoot while they camp, hide camera traps, and hike a few miles into the ancient forests. I know Skookum, and it takes a lifetime of understanding and growth, not just a four-day hiking holiday and some, some amateur knowledge. There is a dark side to Bigfoot searches. Not all of those who track him are without knowledge. There is Silent Owl, a fallen medicine healer whose family died a few years ago during the plague that swept through our homes. His ways have changed. He will not use his magic to heal. The skookum in his eyes has grown cruel and broken. So when the hunters came and asked me if I was Joseph Pale, I told them I would not help them find Bigfoot for it was their intention to shoot the legendary beast and become famous. I told him, Bigfoot is not an animal. He is like a man, peaceful and considerate, unless you are trespassing and planning to hurt his family. I will not help you, and I'd suggest you turn around. I thought that would be the end of it. They could go into the woods with their rifles, and they would find nothing but the ranger waiting to check their hunting permits. I doubted such men could even find an elk let alone Bigfoot. They had no skookum, judging by their oversized rifles. I will help you, but not for less than double what you offered Little Fox. If he has said no, it now costs double. The chilling and calloused voice of Silent Owl spoke from my shadow, where he had walked over from the lodge to see what the hunters wanted from me. Well, all right. The hunter who looked like Matthew McConnell, he said. The others whooped with excitement. We're gonna go bag ourselves a creature that doesn't even exist.
Sal and Al took their money and went with them. I was horrified. The thought of Sal and Al leading them to the sacred lands, set aside for the forest people since the beginning of creation, was appalling and grotesque. I sat for a long time feeling great woe and horror, knowing of the violation that those men planned to commit. My skookum grew weak inside me, and in its place rose up fear. I was truly afraid to do nothing, afraid of what would happen, afraid on behalf of the peaceful and unsuspecting Bigfoot families that Silent Owl had betrayed. I resolved to go and to try and help them, to protect them if necessary. I'm not a hunter of men, and the thought of turning my compound bow on a person and silently assassinating him frightened me. I was not sure where such a thought came from, but I could imagine having Silent Owl in my sights and putting an end to their expedition in just one shot. They might shoot back, but I would be long gone. I trembled, afraid of the consequences of murder, but I also realized I must be willing to do anything, or there was no point in going after them. I went home and called my dogs from the woods, Spritzer and Chief. They came to me wagging their tails and they sniffed my hands and sensed I was about to go on a big hunt, Spritzer growled. He didn't like my fear, but he obeyed me and got into the back of my truck. Chief seemed nervous, following me around while I packed. When I had my backpack ready, I took up my compound bow, a thirty-six caliber revolver, my hunting knife, and a survival hatchet. I loaded my truck with extra fuel and water and food for my dogs. For a long moment, I sat in the cab, in the muddy driveway of my trailer. It was a decision I had to choose to make. I could stop and do nothing, or I could take the warpath. We were soon off the highway and driving up an old dirt logging road, partially overgrown. I stopped at the creek and got out. We hiked the rest of the way up to where the road ends, and there we found the pickup that belonged to Matthew McCungai and his buddies, and it was empty. They had already set out on foot up into the mountains. They had about six miles to hike before they were even at the edge of Bigfoot's territory. I followed them with fear of what they planned to do and fear of what I planned to do weighing in my mind. Old Raven found me and asked me, Where are you going? I ignored the creature and led my dogs. It grows dark in the forest before it is night. And I saw the campfire of Matthew McConaughey's hunting party, and I stopped and set up a cold camp. I fed my dogs and slept little listening to the darkness and hearing the voices of the men as they bragged loudly. In the morning, I waited until they left. I could have shot an arrow into Silent Owl, but I was too afraid. We came to their camp, and I finished putting out their fire. The dripping pines weren't in danger of burning, but it annoyed me that they had littered and left their campfire smoking. My dogs sniffed everywhere, sensing that we were hunting these men. They looked at me questioningly, and I said, I don't know either. I know this is strange, but I don't know how to turn back. When we reached the quiet mountain meadow where my grandfather had seen Bigfoot, I realized we were crossing the threshold. There was no turning back. We were entering into another world, an older and more civilized world. In this place, there was a balance between man and nature, and man wanted for nothing. They were hidden here unseen by the cold and calculating eyes of science. I followed the tracks of the hunters easily, seeing how they blundered through the grass and bushes. The trees shed their dew like a soft rain, and birds who had never seen humans called to each other for the curious gossip of newcomers. I caught up to them and waited some distance away, crouching down and hidden. I thought to myself that if I was going to fire an arrow and put an end to this, that now would be the right time. All I could think about was them shooting back at me, chasing me, hunting me. I was frozen in fear, unable to take action. My dogs were growling softly as they too waited to strike. The hunting party moved on, and I followed them. We began to climb the side of the mountain, and I realized with anxiety that by now Bigfoot would know we were here. It occurred to me that I didn't need to do anything. If Bigfoot was disturbed by the intrusion, Bigfoot had great skookum, and he could fend for himself. 
I had told myself this and used it as an excuse to abandon my foolish pursuit of the hunters. Both of my opportunities to fire an arrow and end silent Al's betrayal had resulted in me paralyzed by fear. I knew I would do nothing. There was no point in me trying. So I told myself to let Bigfoot defend his own lands and to turn back. That is when things became terrifying. My dogs smelled something in the air they didn't like. Their loyalty to me shattered as I told them to stop and to stay, but they ran away, whimpering in terror. I turned, and soon I could smell Bigfoot like rancid swamp water. The foul wind turned my stomach and drove a primal fear into me like a thorn. I looked up, my eyes watering, and saw a blurry image of one great hand curled around a tree at a monstrous height. The angry eyes, almost human, peered out at me from behind the wood. I shook and stood frozen, looking back at it. There was a low growl from the creature, and then it called out in a voice that was too much like the howl of a man. I fell to my knees and dropped my weapon. I put up my hands covering my head. I looked down from it, my instincts commanding my movements. I wanted to survive, and I could sense its rage and its hostility. I prayed, my lips murmuring. Great spirit, please show me as animal, friend. I meant no harm coming here, forgive me. Teach this son of the forest, I am not its enemy. Put compassion in its heart. Bigfoot looked at me and heard my frightened whimpering. It stared down on me for a long time, breathing heavily. It belted an enraged roar, but it did not lift me or harm me. I shook with terror fearing for my life. Then the ground shook as it stomped away and left me there. My legs were shaking as I tried to stand, but my fear had overwhelmed me. I fell down alone without my dogs and lay staring up into the lit green canopy. I took a long time, but my skookum gradually built up inside me, and I decided to follow Bigfoot. I knew that if it thought I was an enemy, I would already be dead. On the ridge I saw the hunters, they had found Bigfoot tracks and were following them. The one who looked and sounded exactly like Matthew McConaughey was in the lead. Silent Owl was behind them. He was looking around, sensing that some hidden danger had him in their sight. This time I let my arrow fly. Silent Owl fell from the ridge, and the other hunters did not notice until he had plummeted to his death. I felt sorrow for my actions, but I knew it was just. He had led the hunters to Bigfoot and in doing so he had begun the killing that was to follow. Forgive me, brother. May you find peace with your loved ones on the other side. I spoke on behalf of Silent Owl, hoping that he would find forgiveness in death and be reunited with his family. For the hunters, death was not so kind or gentle. They found Bigfoot, or rather a band of four younger male Bigfoot found them. They were in a savage mood, having watched all the females and children of their tribe flee in terror. The older male Bigfoot had gone, too. I called out a warning, hoping they would run for their lives. I'd watched the Bigfoot flee before the hunters could find them, vanishing into the forest from the open mountain meadows below. The hunters looked to my position on the ridge, having heard my warning cry. One of them used his rifle scope to identify me. For a split second, I thought I'd be shot, but they knew nothing of my fault in Silent Owl's death. They never climbed down to his body to see the broken arrow. Then the Bigfoot attacked. Their first assault was a test of the strength of the intruders. They didn't kill any of them, but they left injuries and terror on the faces of the hunters. They fired their rifles at close range, but managed to miss with every shot. When the Bigfoot retreated, the hunters were too terrified to continue, all except Matthew McConaughey. I followed him as he set out alone, deep into Bigfoot territory. He was determined to slay Bigfoot and would not back down from their gorilla antics. We came to a part of the forest that was very old, and great boulders were all that remained of some primeval mountain. Beneath the boulders were shallow caves. Each cave had the skeletal remains of a Bigfoot. We had entered their burial ground. Every Bigfoot that had ever died was brought to this place for countless generations, going back to the very first day. 
I shuddered in dread of what the spirits would think of me for entering such a sacred place without right, without tribute. I took one last candid look at Matthew McConaughey, where he was crouched and handling the skull of Bigfoot. I left him there and went back the way I had come. As I wandered back through the forest, I found the first of the fleeing hunters. Bigfoot had broken his neck. I gasped in horror at the sight, but I left his remains there. I had my own skin to save, and I wasn't out of the woods yet. I found the second hunter dead as well. The Bigfoot had relentlessly pursued them and killed at least two of them. I felt dread as I realized the Bigfoot were close, and they were killing every man in sight. Would I be hunted down and brutally slaughtered? I heard gunshots in the distance. I knew the Bigfoot had found the last hunter. I moved on slowly and cautiously. Night was falling, and I felt trepidation at the thought of camping or wandering in the dark. I pressed on, almost to the creek. There I found the last of the hunters. They had torn him to pieces and scattered him all over the place. His rifle was twisted and smashed. I felt sick as the last light was fading. I knelt at the small waterfall and threw up. When I rose, my panic grew at screaming heights as I saw I was surrounded by angry Bigfoot. I knew it was about to be all over. They would descend on me and tear off my arms and bite through my neck. I cowered the sight of them and again fell to my knees. They were closing in on me when I heard a loud and almost chuckling, grunting noise. I looked up and saw the massive old Bigfoot I had first seen. He had come and seen me and was telling the others to let me go. The Bigfoot looked at their leader and then they backed away from me and left me there, shaking in terror. I fled through the forest following the creek until I came to the old logging road. I took one look at Matthew McConaughey's abandoned vehicle, and I knew it would stay there and rust. Nobody was coming back from the hunting party. I walked toward my own vehicle, and when I got there, I tossed my backpack into the back. Chief looked up at me and whined. He had hidden there, waiting for my return. I called a spritzer, but he never came. With my heart heavy at his disappearance, I drove us back to the highway and took us home. That night I sat with my hands shaking and my nerves frayed. I had survived, but my memories of what I had seen and how terrible it all was would linger in my mind forever. I would never have peace again. As I sat thinking about it, I wondered what had become of my other dog. Chief had come inside, having had enough of the woods. He sat miserable, missing his brother. As we sat staring at his empty place by the fire, I heard barking outside. I opened the door, and there he was. Spritzer had traveled all night and somehow found his way home. I was overjoyed, and some part of me began to feel hope. I realized the Bigfoot would again know the peace and isolation they needed to survive. They had let me go because they are not monsters, and they forgave me. Spritzer's return home was like a sign that in the end, all would be well. Hello, I'm a bus driver in a small town in England, and I think I've just picked up a passenger's soul on my bus. This happened two nights ago. I've worked with this bus company for eight, one, two years, and I've driven the same route for three years. Over this time, I've gotten regulars that I've come to know as I see them multiple times a day, some young and some old. I take them to work or to the shops and bingo. I often jump out to help my older passengers with their shopping and whatnot. I've had a passenger that I've taken for the full three years I've done this route. Let's call her Jane. Jane is an elderly lady who suffers from dementia. She was well-functioning for the last two and a half years, sometimes a little confused, but I was always patient and helped her however she needed. I used to pick her up from the bus stop right outside her house, literally a ten-second walk from her door to the bus stop. Every day I'd take her from her house to the local shopping center where she played bingo with friends. However, her dementia worsened in the last six months after an incident on my bus where she got very confused and distressed. I had to stop my bus and try to settle her down. Someone on the bus knew her son, who thankfully worked close by and came over to help. 
I told my manager, who understood and approved from my passengers, to get off my bus and catch the next one just behind, so I could stay with Jane. Calmed her down, took her home, and thanked me for the help. We spoke about Jane, and I explained how we had become friendly over the last few years I had been on the route. I explained she hadn't freaked out like this before. He said he knew, and she spoke fondly of me. Her dementia had worsened, causing her to have bad spells. He took my number and said he would get in touch to arrange a gift for looking after Jean. I insisted it was okay and that I didn't want a gift, but he insisted. He took my number and his mother and left the bus. I never saw Jane again after that day, but I did see the son at the shops. He explained that Jane had gotten worse and unfortunately wasn't safe to leave the house. I thanked him for letting me know, wished her the best, and asked to be kept up to date with her condition as we had become friends over the years. This leads to last night. I'd been covering the late night shift all week when around 11.30 p.m. I was driving by Jane's house. The bus was completely empty. But as I approached the stop, I thought of Jane as I normally do. For some reason, I had an urge to stop at the bus stop outside her house. Even though I could see there wasn't anyone waiting, the urge was so strong that I did. I opened the doors and waited for a second. A cold rush of air entered the bus, and I closed the doors and drove on. I could feel a presence on the bus. About five minutes later, or six stops down the road, I felt someone next to my cab on the bus, as if someone was waiting to get off. I stopped again and opened the doors. I felt the presence leave, and I again continued on, feeling a bit confused. I fully believe in the paranormal. So when I got a call this morning from Jane's son to tell me she passed away two nights ago in her home around 11 p.m., I broke down. I had forgotten about the strange feeling I had that night with a presence on my bus until the funeral. I took the day off and attended the funeral for Jane before going back to the son's house for the wake. The son's house was 30 seconds from the stop where I had let the presence off. I don't know if this is crazy or if I'm just being stupid, but I picked up a presence from right outside Jane's house 30 minutes after she passed and dropped it off at her son's house. Could I have taken Jane's soul on a final trip to see her son before she passed on to whatever is beyond? I really want to believe I did so. I have comfort in the idea that I drove her one last time to see her son one last time. Does anyone else have an experience like this? Thank you and sorry for the long read. Last October, I was in California for roughly 11 days after my brother's wedding in San Diego. I just wanted to drive around the state and visit California places that had captured my imagination over the years, and I loved driving almost as much as I loved cars. I don't necessarily believe in Sasquatch, but I would never discount someone else's experience, especially if I wasn't there. So off I went. Clipper Mills is in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, about 70 miles northeast of Sacramento. Very near that dam was in danger of failing last year. Pretty remote, so after Bodega Bay, I had to cross the state for my destination, arriving near Sacramento in time for a late dinner. So it's after dark when I set out on the final leg, very dark. It takes me a good while on all the twisty turning roads to find my way there. I wanted to get to the exact spot the person who posted the video parked that night. He wouldn't say in his video, so I poked around YouTube's comment sections and related videos and found out more or less about the spot. Around 11 p.m., I pulled my rented Camry well off the dark two-lane road to avoid any issues with the very sparse traffic. I saw no one whatsoever. So I sat in the darkened interior, listening, allowing my eyes to dark adapt for about 20 minutes. I heard nothing but assorted insects while I sat there, saw nothing move at all. Eventually, not wanting to activate the car's interior lighting, I crawled out of the driver's side window into the black night, armed with my cell, with no service, a handheld GPS to find my way back should I get lost in the dark, and a red flashlight I use with my telescope. 
I stood there right by that car window for a solid two minutes before I could screw up the courage to move away from my Camry. Eventually, I walked up the road, still not hearing anything but bugs. Suddenly, without conscious decision to do so, I veered right and headed up into the woods. My feet were crunching pine needles now, and to my mind, I sounded like Bigfoot stomping around. Self, after about twenty minutes, I stopped to listen and added to the insects. I heard this faint screeching sound far off in the blackness, and it didn't sound insect, like at all. It had more consciousness to it. Then now also thoroughly dark, adapted. My mind was whispering that it sounds like a person in distress or a large primate. I remained still. I heard something small scurrying around in the underbrush as well, followed a minute later by that same forlorn, sounding well, but now closer. Time to return to the car. As I was walking back to the car, I heard this spooky sound every twenty to thirty seconds, and now it was coming from behind me and in front of me. It seemed to have a vocabulary of some sort to me, different vocalizations, some guttural, some high-pitched, and everywhere in between. My mind was having fun just messing with me. Now I was never so happy to see a Camry in all my life. I started it up before my ass was in the seat, I think, and half expected to see scores of red eyeballs glowing at me in the headlights from the dark forest in front of me. Now spooked in my mind telling me some homicidal acts, wielding lunatic was nipping at my heels. I went back the way I came at a much quicker pace than I had arrived. Out of nowhere, right in front of me, this black lab ran out of the woods on one side of the road and into the woods on the other. I barely missed crushing him. That scared the hell out of me right there. I slowed down a bit, and the thought of nearly mowing down an innocent mutt overcame my mind. Some hour down the road toward Sacramento is when I noticed I had cell service again. I opened my Expedia app and found a nearby hotel for the night. Once safely enclosed in the hotel room, I began scouring the internet on my iPad and came to the conclusion that what I heard was a barred owl or a western screech owl. Can never be a hundred percent sure, I suppose. Very creepy, though, and I'm done with wandering alone in the dark at night, I think. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.